Welcome back to the Camp Chronicles podcast, episode number 53. And to kick off the year of 2023, I sit down with Dale Hatt and we have a very down-to-earth, open, honest, reflective chat about fishing basically dale is an absolute big carp fishing machine the guy has caught an obscene amount of large fish over the last year uh, i think it's over a dozen 40s 32 30s yeah probably more than that by the time this has come out the guy just seems to catch big fish after big fish after big fish um and he's obviously very very dedicated he's obviously a very good angler and yeah he sits down and and speaks very frankly with me in this episode we talk about a whole host of different things from mindset to bait to tackle to what he feels everyone should be spending their time on on the bank and to be honest i'm listening along and, and just nodding my head the whole time so i think this episode has got something to offer everyone um it's uh, yeah as i said it was an absolute pleasure chatting to dale this guy definitely knows how to catch big carp so you'll definitely want to listen to what he has to say before we jump into this episode just need to mention of course we are proudly sponsored by bp milling .co.uk. Go ahead, check them out. Absolute awesome pellets for fishing. As well as that, they supply pellets for fish farming and fisheries alike who want to feed up their fish with pellets. Check them out, bpmilling.co.uk. Also, big news. I know some of you have been waiting for this. My fish meal base mix called the voodoo it's called the voodoo because there is some funky magic type stuff happening in there that is out now this bait very very different i'm not going to harp on about it for too long but very very different from your standard fish meals this is a true hardcore fish meal there is a ridiculous amount of cpsp90 in there which is a pre-digested soluble fish meal um it's basically designed around that and a few other concepts that i wanted to to bring to market um Lots of other fish meals in there, or I should say high levels of other fish meals in there. Some liver in there, loads and loads of nutrients. This bait is actually extremely good for the carp. And I mean, this is just part of the bait, but my theory that animals and carp being no obsession, um, obs- uh, let me get that word out. I nearly said something terrible then. Carp being no exception to the rule, I think they latch on to what is good for them. I think probably humans used to have this ability but in this modern world we're kind of detached from that but i think animals and carp as well latch on to what is good for them they know what is good for them that doesn't mean that they don't want to have something that's bad for them you know the mcdonald's analogy but generally i think um yeah they know what's good for them and they like eating it because animals are all about efficiency so this bait highly attractive but it's also highly nutritious for the carp as well I won't bang on about it for too long. If you're interested, check out optibaits.com. You can find it there under the base mix section. Go ahead, check it out and see what you think. That's it for the intro. Sit back, enjoy this episode with Dale Hatt. Tip of the episode then. Are you joining me in a drink, Dale? I am, mate. Yes, I'm on uh, Madrid. I've got a couple of ice cold ones. I've been in the freezer about an hour. I was, do you know what? I've seen those Madries around a lot recently. They've sort of come out of nowhere, haven't they? Yeah, they're nice. Really nice. Uh, yeah, I've had a few. I can't take to them, mate. There's a real... I don't know whether I just got a bad batch or whatever it is, but I had a real sort of weird taste to them. Did you get that? Or are they just yeah, like... Um, really I, I think some beers are like that if they're not ice cold, you know? They can taste really different, can't they? Yeah, true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, making an effort to be a little bit healthier this year. <laughs> uh, yeah, what are you on? I've far too many beers recently. I'm on uh, just a gin and tonic um, to begin with. I do have two beers that I'll that I'll drink, but yeah, starting with a gin and tonic. And um, nice. yeah, try and try and not drink too much tonight. But yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, so Dale, mate, as I just said to you before we started recording, a little bit different this episode because I don't know that much about you other than. You've caught a fucking ungodly amount of carp recently. Um, big carp, I should say. 
Um, so this episode is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be very authentic because I'm going to be asking you questions that I genuinely don't know the answer to um, and kind of get to know you as the listener gets to know you. So I think it will make quite a refreshing change, to be honest with you. Yeah. Do you want to just feel the listener and me in on, you know, the the just briefly, you know, your angling history and, and how it's led you to where you are now and what you're doing now in terms of catching carp? Yeah, so um, I'm Essex-based, um, just near Colchester. Um, and I started my sort of fishing journey at around about five years old with Dad. My dad's an a avid carp angler and a pike angler. Um, and like most people, I started gudgeon bashing and perch bashing down the river. Um, and then we sort of joined um, a couple of fishing clubs. One of them was called Billericay District Angling Club. And it had probably eight or nine waters. Um, and I sort of cut my teeth on um, a place called Rectory Ponds um, in a little place called Shelford. And it was actually um, uh, two two half an acre ponds that the monks had. And I think it's actually in the Doomsday Book, I think. Um, and they was full of carp and obviously for the, for the monks' food source, you know. Mm. So there was some real old strain of old commons and sort of wild carp really and uh yeah we used to go over there sort of after school um until it got dark when the gate shut at 10 o'clock and uh yeah just just freelining bread and worms and cockles and uh yeah just sort of crept around in the dark and i was taught all the all the old school watercraft that i don't see people have much knowledge of nowadays you know Mm-hmm. Um, and as you get older, I mean, you just, just don't see people with any warcraft nowadays. I know that's kind of cliche because everyone's got everyone's nowadays is they're quite technical anglers. They're quite good. They've got the best rigs and hand sharpening hooks and all those kind of things. But no one's really got any watercraft. And for me, watercraft is one of the biggest edges to put in big pressured carp on the bank at least i think so yeah 100 percent. and it's it's uh you know probably an overused saying but you know you can have the best rig and the best bait in the world but if you're nowhere near the carp you obviously are not going to catch them are you and that's where the watercraft comes into it um, yeah so uh, i sort of spent many years creeping around and my dad was very um i mean i grew up in the era i think we're similar age i'm 39 um, so I grew up in here watching John Wilson, you know, as um, on Go Fishing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was all, it was quite a lot of watercraft on that program, wasn't there? You know, don't, you know, lift your feet up and don't, don't bang your, your chair. Very much so, you know? yeah. Yeah. And it's like a forgotten art, really. I and mean, that was how my dad taught me up and to be really stealthy. Um, and I remember listening to one of your podcasts when, when you were saying to Pete, like, used to be like a couple of panthers on the bank. Yeah. Down, you know yeah yeah and and that's really what i did i, I crept around with one rod and and, and it, i mean it's a long my, my first rod was a, a solid glass rod mm-hmm. and yeah the amount of say big fish amount of doubles and upper doubles i caught on that i'm nothing more than a, than a size eight drennan super specialist and a lump of bread you know <clears throat> yeah well then i just kind of had a knack of I've got that kind of personality, a little bit OCD, really, where if I do anything, I'm I'm all in, mm. you know, and um, I think that's served me well over the years. So I spent a lot of time on this little sort of rectory pond until probably the age of 10, 11. And then my dad actually lied about my age to get me into uh, an angling club um, in Colchester. Um, and we got to fish a place called Layer Pit. I don't know if you've heard of that. Of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Layer Pit. So that's, you know, 10 minutes from my house. Right. And that was rammed full of carp. And I remember going there for the, the first time with my dad and his friend, and he sort of put us on the place. And I remember standing in the car park and overlooking what was about 10, 10, 10 12 acres. Um, and I think there was 2,500 carp in there. Crazy. And yeah, we we I remember standing there in a kid as a kid in awe, you know. And there was swans you could see with the sun behind them. Um, 
you know, maybe two or three hundred meters away, and the car park was elevated. And just seeing the the swans get blacked out by the amount of fish showing, mm. and it's quite a famous water. That there's that still to this day, if, if you if you see fish showing at layer pits, there's nothing like it. There's really nothing like it. You can see 150 carp in a space of 10 minutes. Is there still a lot of fish in there, is there? Yeah, it did have a fish kill um, a few years ago. I think an auction crash, but there's still a lot of fish in there, mate. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and it was um, it was sort of long-range work, you know, back of the days where uh, we didn't have much money and, and um, we used – a lot of sort of supermarket baits, you know, like chickpeas. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd, we'd go to seed merchants and, and, and get hemp. Um, yeah, and we and, and sort of pigeon conditioner. And it was back in the days where, I mean, it was, it was when you, spoms and spots wasn't out, we made our own. Mm. You know, and it was like a shampoo bottle, holes drilled in it, cork, yeah. cork glued in the bottom. Um, yeah, and, and, and for a spod rod, he was using like a beach caster. Mm-hmm. yeah so that was sort of the main bit of my carp fishing that's where i really learned um the basics and sort of perfected my skills i guess and um yeah even i think i was probably 15 on there in my sort of heyday and uh yeah using a lot of a lot of chickpeas a lot of hemp um well, i used to dye my chickpeas you know and they sort of, I don't know if you ever use much chickpeas, but they really take on colour well, don't they? They do, yeah. Yeah. And we was doing all those kind of things. And, <laughs> yeah, lots of molasses and sort of uh, a lot of my bait knowledge I got from my dad's friend, Stuart, actually, um, who was a real big sort of bait geek. Um, and there wasn't many bait geeks around back in the day, you know, sort of 25 years ago. And... Um, a lot of the base that I picked up from him, and he was massively into kind of fermenting particles. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I know the reasons behind why it works, but all at the time, all I knew was it works. You know, I was a kid, and so what I would do is I'd get uh, you know a sack of maize, a sack of hemp, and I'd soak it all uh, just in hot water in a back garden in a bucket for a few weeks, literally weeks, and then I'd boil it in the same water I soaked it in put it back in the bucket and I'd take the lids on because it would, it would make its own, it, it, the buckets would inflate, you know, mm-hmm. and the, the lids would sort of explode. So I taped the lids on and I had buckets and buckets much to my mum's despair in the garden under the window with mm-hmm. taped lids on, you know, and they was going furry almost. And I used to put um, a liquid sweetener in there that was for use in the wine making crowd, you know. Okay. What um, do you remember? What that was, or I don't. It was a very, very concentrated sweetener, almost right. like almost like Tallinn. Right. Um, yeah, and, and even before that, it was like I'd put a whole bag of sugar in a in a seventeen liter bucket of particles. Yeah. Um, and now I know the reasons why that, that it worked. But at the time, all I knew was it, that it worked, you know? Yeah, definitely, and, uh, mate. Go on. Yeah, and, and yeah, I just caught, I caught a lot of good fish on, on cheap baits. And uh, it was using three, two or three chickpeas on the hair. And it was, it was back in the day where the only decent two hook links you could get was Dacron. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I'm aware of it. Yeah, yeah, and um, amnesia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I use that. Yeah, and so, and it was inline leads, and the, the tubing were on the inline lead was a plastic, hard, rigid tubing. Do you remember them, Sam? I do, mate. Yeah, with well, yeah. they still do leads with those, don't they? Yeah. So that was the, you know, that was about as, as sophisticated as it got. Yeah. And we caught like like tons and tons of fish. I remember one day fishing um, a a swim. The the lake had in the background had a couple of cottages on the far bank. So those swims, it was like three or four swims called the cottages swims. And we'd moved on a little bit then. We was on Vitalin, you know, and Mm. yeah, skull putting a few handfuls of hemp in there, cooked hemp and some pigeon conditioner and Vitalin. And we'd make it all up the night before, 
ball it up and then fill the bucket with maybe 100 balls of this ground bait. <clears throat> and uh, catapults it all out, you know, marker float style. And we, I've done a lot of fishing with a, a method feeder on there, just with vitalin around it, a few scalded pellets, a bit of hemp. Um, and things like chickpeas on the on the hook, and I caught a massive amount of, you know, twenty pounders. But back in the day, that was a big fish. Oh yeah. And like I say, that's still a very sort of prolific, sort of famous venue now. Like I say, yourself, you've heard of Layer, and it's yes, yeah, where I've done most of my proper carp fishing. Yeah. Here's a question for you: Do you still use Vitalin? I do actually, yes. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not bad, is it? It's good stuff. It's got flake maize and stuff in it, isn't it? Yeah, and, um, yeah. it's very good in the winter. I found. Yeah, very good yeah. in the winter. It's uh, I I picked some up. I don't know, probably a year or two ago, just for sort of old time's sake. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's it is good <clears throat> that you know talking about taking on um color the the chickpeas i mean obviously the the vitalin can take on lots of different hydros or whatever you want to put in it really it'll take it on very well won't it so it's a it is a good sort of transporter agent if that makes sense yeah and i guess it's got meat meals and stuff in it isn't it it's got all sorts of stuff in yeah it. crude crude oil it's got ash in it and yeah flaked flaked maize and yeah, it was always a massive carp catch. Right? It used to be, used to get a 15 kilo bag. It used to be 12 pound. Mm. It's probably nowhere near that price now. Probably isn't it? not. No, the last probably... time I bought some was about, about two years ago, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I don't know. Has it got meat meal in it? I don't, I don't know if, it, I don't know if it had well, meat meal in it, but. Well, I, I imagine because it's obviously it's a dog food, isn't it? Mm. It's a cereal based dog food, right? Yeah. I would have known once upon a time. But I don't. Yeah, not that, not that I'd really want a food to feed my dog on that. To be honest, no, no. Uh, but you just put hot water on it for the dogs, didn't you? You sort of left it ten minutes for it to cool down. And um, farmers and stuff used to give it to their dogs. Yeah. But yeah, I'm I'm a massive advocate actually of, of flaked maize in the winter. Hmm. It's um, I think we all probably know the science behind it, but I think it's the roughage in it. Maybe it goes through them pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's it's a carb source as well, <clears throat> and I think fish in the winter they're they're wanting a big return on their investment. The investment being, you know, the effort to eat food, um, and a lot of an animals actually, you know, bulk up through in the winter through having carbohydrates. Yes, uh, people think it's all about fat, um, but yeah, no, it, it, carbohydrate based baits seem to do well in the winter, and I think. I think that's one of the reasons, um, and as you rightly said, you know, yeah, it will it will travel fairly well through the through the gut tract as well, which is obviously a massive a massive benefit. If something's really stodgy and <clears throat> and um and you know fatty and very rich in protein that takes a lot of enzyme activity to break down, obviously the carp aren't going to want to eat that. Something like flaked maize is going to go through them pretty pretty well. And it's going to give them a decent amount of energy that that will be transferred into fat because obviously they're not burning much energy. So yeah. for me personally, I think that's why carbohydrate based baits work quite well in the winter. But I don't really hear anyone talking about that, to be honest. No, I noticed that. Um, I, I I made my own boilies um, for many, many years back in the day where all the raw uh, ingredients I used to use was from Nutribates and yeah. you know the big fish that big fish mix days and the Enervite. Um and then like a, I used to get a yellow seed mix which was from John Baker um, and yeah as you do you experiment don't you I'm a bit of a bait geek and I had I had really good success on just a on big fish mix, to be honest, with some with honey as a sweetener, um, and a little bit of uh, molasses, and no flavour at all. And I remember sort of rolling it all on the hand. On you remember the old gardener hand rolling tables? Oh yeah, I still got a load of them. Yeah, I've still got some. Yeah, I've still got some. And the old like mastic gun. And by the time you'd done a kilo, your hand was in bits, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've still I've still got all that old old kit for sort of nostalgia more than anything um and a lot of a lot of 
a lot of the bait making was you know experimental wasn't it? i used to put this in it and that in it and i remember putting things like nesquik powder in it yeah golden, golden syrup that kind of thing and so yeah so that's really where my love for for bait come from and then since that day i've really just been I and mean, I probably stopped making my own bait about 10 years ago because just, I just can't be asked, you know? I'm with you, mate. Yeah, I understand that completely. Yeah, it is, I still uh, make my own food baits. But... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of effort, mate. you got to be... <clears throat> the thing is, if you're using decent amount of baits, uh, of bait, you know, which when I have the time to fish, you know, if I'm properly on it, I'm using a lot of freaking bait. And it just takes so much time rolling you got to be seriously dedicated and you got to give up other things haven't you so yeah i completely understand mm -hmm. mate i've i've been buying bait for quite a while until i started you know going back to making my own and, and tinkering with some base mixes just for some different waters that i was fishing but yeah it's it's always tempting to get it rolled for you uh, i'm with you mate I totally agree are you you're obviously not rolling your own now are you what what, what are you doing for bait um I've been I've been with several companies over the years. Um, I'm with Nutribates at the moment, um, and yeah, getting on really good with it. But I mean, I've used. I kind of feel like now I'm at the stage now with with any decent bait. Uh, yeah, I will catch. I'm going to catch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I've used several really good baits over the years, um, and several. Not so good baits, but anything half decent, I'm pretty confident with, to be honest. Um, and I, f I feel that the 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 biggest edge for me is, is is the watercraft. You know, the amount of big fish I've caught on 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 bread or corn or cockles. You know, um, yeah, and I, I just I think everyone now is looking for this sort of magical bait that they can't swim past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and there's no such thing. And and, and it, I think if you give any decent angler um, a half decent bait, they'll outfish most people on the lake. Most definitely, most definitely. But I always think if you know if you if you give the very top anglers that just seem to catch them on everything, yeah, you know, if you designed a bait for their water that they were fishing that was just right for their circumstance, I mean, I I really do believe that they would catch more. Um, I really do. Yeah, rightly or wrongly, that that's what I believe. But you're absolutely right. Like Terry Hearn, I mean, he he's yeah, he's exactly just like he's going to do well on whatever you give him, isn't he? He just is. Yeah. I mean, look at look at Jim Shelley. He's been with about every bait yeah. company under the sun, right? And love him or hate him, you cannot deny the fish that that man has caught. And let's be honest, you know, without naming names or being too harsh on any company, he, he's been with a few shit companies, isn't he? But Absolutely. still Absolutely. caught, still caught shed load of carp. Yeah. Um. So you, yeah, it's it's a great argument, and it, you can't argue against it. You you just can't. I mean, I still, uh, I'm a big advocate of my own sort of special hook baits. Um, yeah. So I've been, I still make them to this day, and I've got sort of a, a three or four little things that I'll, that I'll, that I wouldn't make a hook bait without. Um, <clears throat> they go in all my hook baits. Um, what about yourself, Sam? Have you got a few things that you wouldn't make a hook bait without, or? Yeah, yeah, probably. Pro pro it depends on. It depends really. So if I'm fishing over like a, a high protein milk bait. That there, there's going to be some things I wouldn't want it to be without, you know, if I'm fishing yeah. with a high level, uh, high amounts of, of uh, fish meal with different things. Basically, I just uh, got two base mixes. I'll, I'm fishing with one of those two, no matter what. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll use uh, peanuts and things like that as well. But yeah, it depends on the two. There is something that I wouldn't put in that, that I just wouldn't roll either of them without and it's basically it's it's a product I sell I won't name it because I'm not trying to name drop it or anything but yeah. it's a blend of um of salts mm -hmm. some other other things but mainly um nucleotides yeah. and I think adding that to to any bait just it just seems to enhance it, it doesn't doesn't matter what bait you put it with it just seems to enhance it so yeah yeah, yeah. um but I mean, I mean it would it would depend on the thing I mean I wouldn't roll a fish meal 
not I'm not talking about hook bait here. I'm talking about fee bait. I wouldn't yeah. roll a fish meal without CPSB90, a pre-digested fish meal in it. Mm-hmm. Like I just wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't roll a, a milk bait without calcium caseinate in it, for example, or, or some yeah. hydrolyzed um, hydrolyzed milks. So it depends I mean, on the bait, but yeah, I mean, hook baits is a different game altogether. And I think hook baits are really exciting because you can do things with a hook bait that you couldn't do with a feed bait. Um, yeah, you, you can personalize the as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot that you can do. There really is. Um, yeah, I mean, with what you're doing with your hook baits, is it something you want to share with people or you want to keep it to yourself? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll get a, a good pop up or a wafter mix from someone like Bath, you know? Um, British Aquafeeds. Um, I'll use the the best egg that I can, you know, like a local. A few things. I'll make my own garlic oil if that's of any interest. But I'm quite I'm quite anal about that. Um, that's a, a massive massive edge for me in the last sort of four years. I've really done well with it. Um, and how I go about that is, I get a load of uh, good quality sort of. Uh, bulbs of garlic from like a farmer's market something like that um i wrap them in tin foil and i sort of roast them overnight right. on a real, real low oven okay um and then i get like a decent oil like a like a rapeseed oil something like that um and i put all that garlic into a blender with some rapeseed oil i blend it liquefy it um and then i put it pour it through some like muslin um, filter it and that goes into like a glass bottle and I'll coat my my pellets with that or that goes actually into my hook baits, um, which sort of helps them roll if I do cork balls. Um, one of the other things that I'll, I'll put in most of my hook baits is GLM powder. Um, yeah, and absorbic acid, that's a big one for me. I think that's definitely an edge. Is that ascorbic acid? Did you say yeah, ascorbic acid? Yeah, yeah, vitamin C. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I'll probably. I'll, I'll probably go for about for about five, uh, five grams in maybe something like that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, quite high levels. Um. Back in the day, I I got a lot of my sort of hook bait info off of uh, Frank Warwick. You know, he was a big ad, big advocate, wasn't he? Boosted hook baits and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I tried that over the years, and yeah, and as a single, I've had I've, I've had lots of success on high levels of embuteric, um, certain essential oils uh, was always really good to me. I mean, I used to use like a Jaffa oil. You know, remember the Nutribase Jaffa oil? I do. Yeah, I've done really well on that. Just that with big fish mix. Um, yeah, again, garlic essential oil. I also use a powdered garlic, which I get from a, a horse feed company. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with them in any of my baits. Um, yeah, so um, again, it's a confidence thing, isn't it? But I've, I've had some really big hits over um, over using this garlic oil. Really big hits. Um, Interesting. Mm, yeah. What's your yeah. experience of garlic oil? Are you a fan? or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's... <laughs> Hit and miss with the essential oil, I think, to be honest with you. Obviously, what you're using isn't an essential oil. It's a bit different. Um, I think there's a lot of mileage in garlic. And I don't know if you heard the podcast I did with uh, Ben Pinager. Pinager. Yeah, from BP Millen, yeah. Yeah, I always mess up his his name. Sorry, Ben. I'm sorry, mate. Um, but yeah, obviously, he he has his garlic products, and I rate them highly. Like His G-Force is the concentrated garlic liquid um and then he's got the oh shit what is it called naturopal uh, yeah which is which is his garlic stuff with a, a, a certain oil i don't know if i'm allowed to name it or not um and yeah i mean and there's a i mean garlic is being used in baits for for many many years and and for sure it gives it it certainly gets results ben's kind of ideas around it for repelling um parasites i think are really really interesting and yeah, it seems well, I've got a lot of people that that, that, that have got fish, that, that friends that have got fisheries, and they swear by it for for getting rid of argulus and and parasites and the gills and that kind of thing. I mean, 
how much science behind that, I don't know. But, I mean, it goes in horse feeds, doesn't it, for the same reasons for, for immune system support. Yeah, I mean, garlic has got a whole host of different um, effects on on the body, and it would seem a carp. I don't know if there's an overwhelming amount of studies on it in carp, to be honest, but it seems a lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, but it certainly it certainly seems to work. That's for damn sure. Yeah. The only thing that I have a question mark over it is the potential for it to impair the brain function of carp. Right. Um, that's the only thing that that like, and again. There's no hard science on this whatsoever, so it's impossible to say. But I think that's that's a, a potential thing that that should be looked at. Maybe I don't know. There, well, you know what? I could list down. A, I'm sure I could list down a couple of hundred different things that I would love actual scientists to do studies on. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, I'm not clever enough to do that stuff. Um, you need proper scientists with proper yeah labs equipment and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, um, I mean, I don't know how this is only from from sort of my experience with it. I kind, I was on the, the the opinion of I've always done really well with sort of garlic um, oil and, and 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 garlic in my hook plates where there's been wild garlic growing. Interesting. I think it's like a it may be in their in their. DNA almost. Um, everywhere I've tried garlic uh, in my hook baits, I've, I've, I've always called the, 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 the better older fish with it. Um, and I think it's something to do with they, they've seen it before. They've seen wild garlic in the river systems or in the, you know, in the, over many years, over generations of carp, you know? Mm. How, how, Right, that is. I don't know. I might be completely wrong, but in my experience, um, it's pretty hot. I mean, the essential oils are really strong, aren't they? The garlic essential oil is mega overpowered. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I remember years ago, growing up, we, me and my friend Andrew, was uh, on a really silty little club lake, and it had some massive tension. Uh, and we made our own ground bait up, you know, with, with like. We used to put breadcrumb in the blender and all those kind of things. Um, and we put onion, we liquidised some onions and we liquidised some garlic. And I'm telling you, that was the best tench catcher I've ever used. It was just mega and it stunk to high heaven. But you know, again, it's, you know, Mexican onion oil is pretty, it's pretty sort of a cult following, isn't it? You know, in the bake makers. Have you had any experience with, with using Mexican onion oil? Oh yeah, F phenomenal! I there's some of that in the wizard flavor that that, that I do. Yeah, very good ingredient. Yeah, yeah. And you think that's working on the same kind of um, lines as the garlic? Do you think? It, it's yeah. If you look at the the text uh, tech um, sheet of it, it, they share a lot of different compounds, but it, it's obviously in different ratios, and it has things that garlic doesn't, and vice versa. Yeah. Um, but yeah, quite quite possibly. I mean, I think they they've been used together in a lot of baits historically. I don't know so much now. I don't know if I think maybe Mexican onion oil's probably out of vogue, and and garlic's probably very much in vogue. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, both both great ingredients, in my opinion. Yeah, so there 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 are a few things that, that I'll, I'll always put in hook baits: um, full fat GLM. I know it's hard to get hold of decent stuff nowadays. Um, yeah, and I use I use uh, like a decent manuka honey for a sweetener. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, garlic and honey seems to seem to go well together. Um, yeah, so far I, I'm, I'm I sort of make and pimp and boost my own hook baits up. Um, I mean, I used to back in the day when I made my own bait, I was using things like capelin and sardine and anchovy extract and i was getting it all from places like marriages you know yeah and i had some some great success on like i say just a decent i mean this is how long ago well, i used to make the the, the the base mix up in in my mum's bathtub how about that you used to do what sorry I used to make the base mix all the dry powders up in the bath <laughs> oh man because yeah. i was Enamel, nothing stuck, you know. 
Yeah. And that was how I used to do it. And it's, yeah. But um, yeah, we caught some fish off it. Well, I'm sure you did, mate. Yeah, um, I'm sure I think you did. I'm now doing it with sort of electric cement mixers and those kind of things, don't they? Yeah. But this was, was before all that. And yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it brings back fond, fond memories, you know. But like I say, now I don't have time to to make the amount of bait that I would use. It would, it would just, I'd be forever rolling bait rather than fishing. Yeah. Yeah. How much how much fishing are you doing on average per week? I imagine it changes during different times of the year, but just sort of tell us what how much bank time you're spending. Um, two nights without fail a week. Yeah, two nights a week without fail. That might be during the week. It might be weekends. Right. Work dependent, but yeah, without fail, two nights a week. Um, and I almost... The worse of the weather, the the keener I am to go. I know that sounds funny, but I kind of feel like there's less people on the bank because who's mad enough to go out in horrendous winds and rain? And then anything you do see, you can you can move on it quicker. You can make more of the opportunities you, that you see because the banks are quiet. So that's um, yeah, that's quite a big thing. Um, yeah, I think that because when you go and it's lovely and the weather's great and it's sunny and, you know, all the stuff that, that, that you know, people, these fair weather fishermen, but you can't you can't capitalise, can you, on anything that you see? No. Because well, it's, it depends on the lake, doesn't it? But, yeah, vast majority of lakes these days you can't. No. I mean, anything with with any any venue with big sort after fishing they're busy aren't they there's no such thing now as a quiet venue with yeah. big fishing it's, they're very far and few between so yeah I like going when the weather's terrible to be honest um, getting blown away and fighting the winds to get the bivvy up um, yeah that's a sucker like mental thing for me I believe it's uh, and I've had some some mega catches in storms and uh, uh, you know low pressure horrendous winds and yeah, I've just had some mega catches. I've got fond memories of, you know, me and my pal being in the same, got in one, put his bivvy down and got in one bivvy because so we, we was basically sleeping, holding onto the bivvy, you know. And I've had some mega catches over the years doing that. So, yeah, so minimum two days a week, um, three or four if I can, work dependent, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh yeah, so as much as I can, but if I'm not fishing, I'm walking the bank to take the dog over there and, and have a walk. And that's another a, a big part of, of, of Warcraft, isn't it? Right? Keep sort of keeping your ears to the ground, trying to get as much time over there as you can. Yeah, let, let's uh, let's talk about that. Because, I mean, again, as I said in the beginning, like I don't know you that well at all. I, you know, very little, actually, to be honest with you. But I know you've caught a lot of fish. Um, and we've briefly spoken before and you said it's like, you know, you are very dedicated to what you're doing and very motivated. You know, you say, you know, if if, if the weather is terrible, you just want to get out there. I've been like that before, but I, I to be honest, I haven't I haven't like got my teeth into a water to that level for a long time. Um, but you're obviously very, very dedicated, very, very motivated talk to us about that because it's the kind of mindset side of things it's not really spoken about in in fishing but if you want to go out to these these big fish waters and you want to catch the big fish you have to be dedicated and you have to seriously apply yourself so this is obviously something that you do quite well um, and i know i'm sort of springing a, a broad question on you but can you can you tell us about that you know how you're dedicated how you got to be dedicated and and what it entails and what it means for your angling um i'm i'm sort of big into being mentally strong and i think uh your brain gives up before your body does you know um and I, i've always weight trained all my life and for me the biggest motivation i can have with anything is someone saying you can't do that or you won't catch that you know um, and that's what really does drive me um and i've I've read lots of sort of motivational books and, and, and that kind of thing and uh, listen to the likes of David Goggins and, and Mike Tyson speaking and a common denominator with all those successful people is they just 
they seem to put work in while other people are sleeping. Yeah. Um, and for me, that was a mental, uh, that's what I needed to do to make me feel better about myself, basically. So when I was running a lot, I would run at two o'clock in the morning. I was, I'd go to bed and set my alarm and run at two o'clock in the morning. Why? Because I, because I'd read something about Mike Tyson and Muhammad Ali saying that <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, that they run when people are sleeping. When when other people are getting soft, you're getting hard, you know. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and yeah, that's just what motivated me. And yeah, I I I, I sort of turned that to fishing and um yeah, back to anything you do so you can capitalize on it because you're in out in these horrendous weather conditions or it's you know, it's minus four or five and um and no one's on the bank. So you can really, you can really sort of keep your ear to the ground, and you can move, and you can poke a rod for a little hole there, and stick a rod in a swim down there because there's no one there. Um, and I think that just snowballed after success of of catching the odd big and here and there, and it was always in these horrendous conditions. And I remember, um, I won't name the venue, but it's a little venue four or five mile from me, and it's it's right on the edge of a, a nature reserve. And the place is only about two acres and it's full of islands and it's it's got maybe it's got five, six islands and it's massively, massively weedy, crystal clear water. And it's full of that duckweed, you know, that sort of puts a film across the whole water. I yeah. Um, and that sort of that place really taught me a lot, to be honest. Um, I don't know if you've had much experience with, with sort of big carp in small waters but they can be very funny places to fish absolutely very finicky fish very very difficult yeah, I've, yeah. I've, on a big pit if you find them and you can catch them on a simple rig and a simple bait they're pretty easy to easy catch easy yeah location's the issue yeah and on a little pit it's hard because you're seeing these fish swim past all the time aren't you so you, you know the fish is there um but they won't kind of feed it's little spots that you know the size of a a dinner plate, you know, yeah. Yeah. you can get a bite there, but you can't get a bite six inches over. Um, and I put a lot of time in maybe three or four years ago um, on this little pit, and it had some right, some right gems in it. And it was old, it was an old gravel works. Um, so it was crystal clear water, it was obviously filtered by loads of weed. And I think there was four or five types of weed in there. And it was beautiful, overgrown in the wood. Um, beautiful during the day but quite a creepy place at night you know um, yeah and a friend of mine had the lake and he sort of basically said you know help yourself and uh, I had the place to myself really you'd see the odd person every now and again but it was typical that you know people nowadays are quite scared of weed aren't they and uh, yeah that sort of put a lot of people off it was ridiculous of the weed but for me that makes it easier because I don't know about your experience with weed, but when you go to a lake and there's no weed, right, which is what a lot of people enjoy, yeah. you can just pub chuck it, can't you? Um, yeah. But then you don't know where the dinner table is, right? Because Exactly. Yeah, I know exactly where you're going with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the places for weed, for me, was easier to catch because all your hats do is, you know, they're not feeding in that thick weed, that candy floss weed and that duck weed. So as soon as I found the little clearing, it was just it was just easy, the little telltale signs, you know. Um, and for whatever reason, weed is like a, it fries carp anglers' heads, doesn't it? It seems to, but yeah, I mean, I, I said this to, to 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 Pete, who I used to do the podcast with. Like, you're fishing a water that's choked with weed. A lot of the the, the waters where I am are. It's easier because you you like the 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 areas that you can actually fish dramatically diminished. Um, and as you rightly said, you can see where the carp are feeding. Um, yes, there there can be kind of there can be weed on the surface over, you know, and there's tunnels underneath and the carp can be feeding there. Yeah, I get all that. I do get it, but you're massively narrowing down your your realistic options of where you can fish when it's choked with weed. Problem comes if if the banks are really busy as well, obviously, and then it's a freaking nightmare. Yeah, but, well, this place yeah. was that weedy that it was people would go over there, you know, with, with high hopes at the beginning of the season. And then they'd look, they'd pull up in a car park and look, and it was just 
floor to ceiling. And it was only probably three to five foot deep in the deepest part. Um, really pretty, full of islands, surrounded by woodland, um, amongst rape fields. Beautiful, beautiful place. The crystal clear water and probably 50 carp in there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they'd come with, with great expectations and then you wouldn't see them again. They'd do a couple of trips and you wouldn't see them. So I kind of had the place to myself. And, Perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's what beautiful. you want. Yeah. yeah. I'm very... I'm very anti anti social when I'm fishing. Yeah, um, and I've heard you talk about this. That the venue is as important as the fish, definitely. Yeah. And it's kind of that little bit of solace for me, you know. Yeah, and it was just nice being over there on my own, literally just having the place to myself. Uh, even if I wasn't catching anything, and you could, uh, you could. It was so weedy. Um, the guy who ran it um, allowed you to use a boat. And there was two wooden boats over there, which was already, you know, on the lake. Um, and I got a little inflatable and I used it myself, you know, because I felt like the old wooden boat with a wooden oar was quite noisy. And I remember um, I was up a tree one day um, in the deepest part of the lake, which is about five foot, in the, in the, the furthest part from the car park. And a lad turned up and he went out in the boat to find some spots in the car park. And I was up this tree uh, watching fish in this crystal clear water. And there was three or four fish. And it was probably, I don't know, 90 yards from where this lad was in the boat. And he dropped an oar in the boat. And I was up the tree looking down and I see all these fish spook from, from 90 yards away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, massively. It all, all, they, all, they all went stiff. The dorsal stood up. The pecs flared, and they was definitely communicating with each other. Then talk, talk to us about that. The communicating with each other. I think. I mean, we'll never know, will we? But I, I think they. I mean, for instance, I've been up this tree, and previously I'd seen um, same guy. A guy turn up in the car park and start leading around in a weedy lake you know that's what people do in it and i've seen these fish and uh, uh, was happily sunbathing um, in a sort of uh shaded canopy and the sun was gleaming through a little little gap in the trees and you could see them and there was four or five fish sitting there uh, a couple of them was 30 pounders the others was upper 20s um and they're so in tune with their environment this this guy flicked the lead out and you see the fish go stiff, you know? And they didn't sort of spook off the spot and bolt out, but you see their, their body language completely change. Tense up, yeah. Yeah, just, you know, like when you catch a white male trying to hold it and they go all stiff and then you can you can feel them. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they sort of showed that body language and I thought, oh, there's something in that, you know? Um, this was from 90 yards away. So I went and got myself an inflatable boat. Um, I don't know if you've done much boat work, but uh, how the fish treat you when you're in a boat to how the fish treat you when you're on the bank is is, is day and night. Yeah. Same as if you're you know, wading, I've found. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's mad, really. But I would go out in this little inflatable, and you could get right on top of these 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 35-pound-plus carp feeding, right on top of them, two or three feet away. And because you was in the water in their environment, they didn't see you as, as a threat almost. Did, did that lake get any other boats on there or is it just from anglers? No, it was literally two two kind of 10-foot wooden rowing boats that the anglers used to use. See, that's interesting. <clears throat> that is interesting. On venues where, you know, perhaps it's also uh, like a sailing lake, etc. you know, it, 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 the carp are just seeing it day in, day out for, you know, nine months of the yeah. year. Um, yeah, yeah. But on a water that's just boat only, for, for them, you're saying that you could be over them in the boat and they would continue to feed. That's 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 crazy to me. When I was in a rubber boat, and it, bear in mind, the, the place I was in it was in the main body of, the, say, it had five or six islands, little, little dot islands, and um, it was like a full of nooks and crannies, this little place, little dog legs and yeah. shade, beautiful, full of... Full of uh, amazing. Full of weeping willows and... But it had four or five types of um, weed in it. And like I say, it was on the edge of a nature reserve. Middle of nowhere. Beautiful place. And um, it was one of them places um, that was 
the size of the water for water, like I say, it was about two acres, maybe a, maybe a little bit smaller than two acres. It's hard to sort of gauge it because it's it was had so many little corridors and bays and um, but it had a lot of big fish in it for the, for that size of water. And I say a lot of big fish. It probably had ten good thirties in it. And um, yeah, crystal clear, four or five types of weed, lilies, kingfishers. <laughs> And they was very, like, you know, like we were saying about the small venues, they're very in tune with their environment. So I've seen that happen from up a tree um, with the lead and then a week later with the with the wooden boat. And I'd see these fish definitely communicate. And, and they went, the, the guy dropped an oar or landed it pole in the boat. He banged around in the boat anyway. Um, and I see these fish just stiffen up. And it's common coming and it nudged, it, it headbutted this mirror in the side. As if to say, come on, we're off. Yeah. And hesitated and it nudged it again, and then they all all left in the group. Um, and what they was doing, I think, they was just sitting in the, the deeper part of the it was like their little sanctuary. And I've witnessed these fish feed in this area multiple times, but I couldn't get a bite from there. And it was like a place like it was almost like their garden. They'd go there to sunbathe, you know, make the most of the weather, but they wouldn't eat there. Um, and you see lots of little little mega spots, you know, little tiny gravel spots, and it was crystal clear, and it was over the canopy of these weeping willows, and it just looked pucker, but for the life of me, I couldn't get a bite there. I tried many, many times, and a couple of other anglers, decent anglers on the water said the same. They'd seen them there many times, they just couldn't get a bite. So anyway, I went and got this inflatable boat, um, and it sort of transformed my fishing, because I could sneak up on these fish, and like I say, how they 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 acted when you was in the boat was they just didn't seem to spook off you. And occasionally, if you did push your luck a little bit, they would move off the spot, but they wouldn't. They didn't look scared. You know what I mean? They they'd, they'd know you was there, sort of give you a bit of space. Mm. They didn't react the same to when someone threw a lead in or dropped. You know, it was in a wooden boat. Um, and what I was doing, I was there was this this duck weavers across the whole lake basically, and, and how I had success was. I was uh, fishing with my tips up in the air, you know, braid, uh, because I didn't want to have, put, have the line amongst all that weed because the weed would slowly drift when it got a bit of a wind on. And then I, I was sort of fearful that it was moving the lead. So I had the rods up in the air, um, you know, 30 pound braid on, and I was using big leads. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of a big lead. I, was using, I had my friend of mine, um, Actually, he's got a lead business and he made me up some sort of like eight ounce, eight ounce gripper leads. Um, so I was fishing leads on lead clips, big leads. And I'd go out in the boat and with my oar, I would move all the floating weed mm -hmm. and drop the rigging on the little spot. And I, I wouldn't put it on the blatant spots. So I'd put it on like a, a spot that was just longer than the hook link, you know, just so you could get the hook link in. Yeah. And then I'd move all the weed back over it, mm -hmm. you know. So it was the, the and the, that it made a massive difference, a massive difference. Where I think what the what most of the people was doing was was going out and looking for a blatant clear spot. So the, the sorry to stop you, <clears throat> the weed that you moved over, it wasn't like lying directly on top of the rig. There would have been. You know, it was a, all, a space of water between the weed and the the rig. Is that what you mean? Or? It was all that floating duckweed, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you might have a clear spot on the bottom. It's only sort of three and a half, four foot deep in these spots. Yeah, you have massive floating weed beds. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Most of the more hens could walk across the surface of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I'd go out and 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 move the move the floating weed with an oar, you know, like a window wiper. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like kind of action. And lower the, the bait and, and straighten out the rig, and you got perfect presentation. Does, and then I'd let it doesn't get any more perfect. Sorry to interrupt you, mate. It doesn't get any more perfect than that, in in my opinion. That is yeah. the ultimate. It was oh yeah, and I learned so much, and I learned more from that from fish behaviour. You know, um, and I think I'm at that point in my angling now where I can't really learn much off of anybody. I, you, you kind of learn off the carp, don't you? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I witnessed, uh, I, and I caught a couple, 
And then when I started just making these little little changes like that, like moving the weed, and I wouldn't put the I'd, I'd put the lead and the leg clip and all that in in the in the chod, you know, and just have the little bit of the hook link laying out. And I say like, all I wanted was a spot about ten inches, just long enough to get the hook link in. Um, and then I'd let the weed go back over the top. Uh, I'd put the rod tips right up in the air, like like you're beach fishing almost. And I'd, I'd peg the back of the rods down with a couple of ten pegs. And I'd fish kind of locked up, you know, tight lines locked up. Um, and you'd get a couple of bleeps and it was on. You know, the chuck that that big lead would drop off and they'd be nailed. And it was kind of hit and hold stuff. And I'd just jump out in the boat. As soon as I picked the rod up, I wouldn't even try to land them from the bank. I'd, I'd um, yeah, jump straight in the boat in my knees, just pull myself out and, 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 and let them get in the weed, you know, and then just net the ball of weed. And that place taught me so much, you know, um, about fish behaviour. So that was a that was a, a big sort of eye opener, you know. Something I want to just pick on before we 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 uh well before you move on, you said about lengthening out the the rig. <clears throat> I totally understand that. Yeah. <clears throat> so they've got sort of less less room to get away with it, so to speak. What are your thoughts on the whole rig being completely laid out? Because obviously, depending on well, it's, how the rig works and depending on the direction that the carp come from, it can be a great thing or it could fail to get actually in their mouth, if that makes sense. Yes. Well, I think now there's a fad, isn't there, with a rig that, you know, inverted commas, a rig that resets itself, right? It's a massive fad, isn't there, with that? It's fashionable. Yeah. You know, um, Everybody, I mean, it's got the cordable has kind of popularized it, I guess, from the underwater films, didn't they? Mm. Um, about the, you know, you've, you're, I'm sure you've, you've seen it. Most rigs now, people say, Oh, it resets itself. Um, but back then, it wasn't, it, it wasn't cut, uh, such a fad, you know. And I think now, every time you put a uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I won't use a Ronnie rig, for instance. Um, I think every time you use a, a fashionable rig you're conditioning the carp you, you're teaching them right definitely yeah so then it wasn't the thing um and i was just lengthening out so it came my, my sort of thinking behind it was it came in contact with the lead sooner but yeah you're right like you say if they come in from the wrong angle coming from the lead side they they suck the bait and they it, it doesn't have enough movement does it to go into yeah. the fish's mouth Exactly. Yeah. So is yeah. that something that you endeavor to do to have it all like laid out straight? Or no. do you like a little concertina in it? Well, um I I was using um a hinge stiff rig, um, or on the really clear spots I would use like a, a short stiff rig, you know, but I'd use a supple hair. So I would use maybe like five inches of fluorocarbon and I'd tie on like a, a supple hair out of a bit of like old school 25 pound silkworm or something. Yeah. Um, and that would sort of hook them in the scissors, you know, decent hook holes in the scissors. But that was as the fish realised the problem, they turned the head and it would kind of nail them in the side of the mouth. Um, but I say this was before everybody was using like a, a, a self, you know, resetting rig basically um but like i said i think you're conditioning these fish every time you cast a ronnie rig out every time you do what do, do the same as everybody else i think you're 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 learning you're teaching those fish i mean are you familiar with that do you think that's do you think that's right or definitely yeah of course you, we're conditioning them time and time again 100 percent agree with you yeah yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, a big lead, I think, was a, a major thing as well because they just can't deal with a big lead, in, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I agree with you there. Yeah. Um, the bigger, the better. On, on a, it was on a lead clip, and I wouldn't use a tail rubber. I would just tie the lead clip up with a bit of PVA tape. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I wasn't doing initially, I'd take the. I'd, I'd, I had some 10-foot rods made up. I had some uh, some century 10-foot um, 
rods made because I thought in a boat, 10 foot rods, you know, it's more manageable than a, a 12 foot rod, right? Um, and then a friend of mine, actually, a very good angler, um, said to me, look, leave the rod on the bank. And it was all overgrown the island. So you, as you approach the island, you had the rod, I'd have the rod land across the front of the, the, the dinghy kind of thing. Um, I'd only have one oar. And I'd have like a little bum bag on me with a handful of bait in the front of it. Yeah. And uh, I was initially taking the rod out and then donking the lead round, you know, using an aquascope, that kind of thing. Mm. Pretty clear. So you can see what you're doing. But it's, that's, it sounds easy, but that's a lot harder in a bit of wind. Yeah. Getting yourself back to the bank and getting a decent line lay. And then what I started doing is I started putting all the, the rod tips up in here with the, the butts clip down with 10 pegs and I would hang all the, I'd get me three rods for any baits on all that kind of thing. And I'd have the rods high enough up in the air that I could get the dinghy underneath. So I wouldn't have to get out of the boat. So I'd put, oh, what I'd do, I'd, I'd put the leg clip in my mouth. I'd put the line over my shoulder. I have a, a soft clutch and I'd just row out, you know, take line off and I wouldn't take the rod out. I'd leave the rods on the bank. Um, and I'd drop that. I'd donk the lead round, you know, with by hand straighten it all out and and uh, do it that way. Then I'd come back in and get the second rod and, and I, I would hook the rig into the tip ring. So I could just come underneath it with the boat, reach up, grab the grab the, the hook bait, unhook it from the tip ring, the bait runner was on, then I'd go back out to the next spot, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. Yeah, and, and just little things like that made, made it much easier because the weed was an absolute nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. Um, and over the years, those little things, those little little um, tells, those little giveaways can make the biggest of difference, I think, when you're fishing for pressured carp. Yeah. Um, Most, I mean, definitely. Most definitely. Most <clears throat> definitely. Sorry, carry on, carry on. Yeah, just... just... <sighs> I mean, hindsight's a fabulous thing. Looking back, the small list of, uh, of things have caught me some of the best fish I've ever caught. You know, just, just a very small tell that you see um, make the biggest of differences. I know it's all percentages, that kind of thing. But, but yeah, back to that Warcraft thing, you know. And I was watching, I've done a lot of time watching the fish. Um, and there's that old saying, isn't there? You know, like 10 minutes in the right place is better than 10 hours in the wrong place. Yeah. And, and I l learn a lot about fish and rigs from just watching these fish from a boat. And I mean, if you can, if you ever have the chance to get out in an actual dinghy above the above the spot, you learn so much more, don't you? Oh, because you you're seeing you're seeing exactly what you need to see from a completely different dimension. I mean, we, we can climb trees and this, that, and the other, but yeah like you say getting over a spots in the boat just getting a stick like literally just getting a long prodding stick and prodding around you learn a lot don't you just from feeling what the bottom feels like it's very different from from what you'd presume it to feel like yeah yeah you mean, that alone and then let alone actually viewing carp yeah i agree with you yeah yeah 10 minutes in the boat is worth a day with a marker float in it oh for sure yeah and then some there's things you'll never learn with a mark float that you'll learn in a boat very quickly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I learned a lot from that little venue and caught, and, and, and some of the fish actually, um, some of the pictures of the fish that I sent you, um, some of those are from that water. Um, I'm just going to go back and have a look. Um, yeah. Just mega. Um, there's a picture of a common I sent you. Um, so it's a 40 pound common. Um, I don't know if you've got a picture of that on your phone, but that was that was the target fish I was after. <clears throat> Just getting it up now, mate. What? Uh... I've got a grey flat cap on. Right. Do you know what, mate? You sent me a lot of pictures of a lot of big fish. <laughs> you got a grey flat cap in most of these photos. Oh, yeah, I love a flat cap. I'll see you. <laughs> yeah, so do I, mate. Oh, yeah. A grey cap. Uh, okay, yeah. Common, fairly Big tail, fairly thick wrist, quite yeah. long, not too gutsy. That was, that was the, the, the caliber of fish in there. Got a bit of mouth damage, that one? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, 
because it was like I said, I think it'd been caught a, a, a few times over the years, but it was like hit and hold, you know? Yeah, because no, yeah, really yeah. Awesome. but yeah, mega fish, mega dark, lovely, of, yeah, lovely, yeah. At what size was that? That was just over 40 pound, 40 pound yeah. eight. Um, that was the, the, the what I joined for basically. Mm. Um, there was lots of other mega fish in there, dark, old, um, crusty fish, you know, and um, so yes, yeah, so that place really taught me a lot. Um, yeah, and and I think watch if you can watch fish feeding naturally, um, confidently, comfortably, you can learn so much. And that's another thing that isn't done now, isn't it? it, it people just don't don't watch them. Yeah, no climbing in snags with a set of polaroids and. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mega to just to watch them fish. Or, you know, if you, I'm sure you've done it, you know, climbing snags and you're hand feeding them, you're fickling bits of bread or bits of boilie crumb. And and they definitely communicate. I mean, what's your opinion on that? Do you think they communicate? Yeah, I mean, definitely physically, like you said earlier, they, they'll nudge each other. And I think visually, I mean, if you can call this communication, like you say, one of them will stiffen up. And then maybe if another one turns yeah. and catches sight of that one, that's like in a stiffens, you know, it's, it's got its dorsal up, but it's got its fins out, its pectoris. I think they'll react like that, whether you can call that communication or not. I don't know. I know some people believe that there's like some other form of tele, you know, uh, communication, whether it's like tele telepathy or whether it's, they, I don't know, freaking emit some wave through the, the the water i don't know but i know some people think that they can kind of talk to each other in a weird way i'm not sure on that i'm not sold on that um i wouldn't completely discount it for sure but yeah i think physically they'll communicate you know like they'll nudge each other along and and dictate or they'll nudge people you know nudge other carp out the way to feed and they're definitely physically letting their intentions be known but other than that i don't have any like solid beliefs on it if that makes sense i'm very open-minded though no i mean all stuff in fishing you can only go off your experience you've had can't you yeah you know? yeah when i look in, in in nature with all nature everything seems to be able to communicate with with, with its own species right yeah uh, dogs do it you know um uh, herd animals do it then they prey animals definitely do it yeah um, predators not so much because they seem to be solitary animals don't they can um, be not always though. if you look at like red kites or something they'll they'll swarm together and then they'll go off and they'll hunt weird like very interesting animals yeah absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about so i don't no, know why i'm bringing that up but, but, yeah, but, but yeah mostly solid solitary animals other than like wolves and you know pack yeah. animals but yeah yeah generally speaking yeah yeah so that that place taught me a lot um and it was, I, I loved it, to be fair. And then then the word got out what sort of special fish was in there. Um, and then a couple of, we'll call them celebrity anglers, um, got on there. And then at that point, that was me off. Um, I caught them all. Um, I, caught, I caught every every fish in there, bar one. Um, and, yeah, a couple of celebrity anglers got on there. And then it just become manically busy and and too commercialized and that wasn't a bit of me and then then i left you know and then i went on to a 120 acre uh gravel pit which used to supply water to the colchester borough um yeah mega mega place a mega reservoir um 40 foot deep in some places a massive head of bream. Um, it was like the sea, you know. It was like it was. It was very daunting when I first went on there. Very daunting because you think, where do you start? Yeah, you know. Um, but the fish was definitely easier to catch, but you had to locate them. I agree with you. It's like you, it's like you said earlier, these big waters, <clears throat> like you say, super daunting when you're not used to them. Especially like you're used to a a sort of four or five acre pond or less than that and then you go out to like a hundred acre pit very very daunting but like you say you're very right you find those fish they're easy to catch um 
yeah, yeah it's, it's just a different headspace that you need to be in don't you yeah and it takes a while doesn't it for you to to, to sort of get in sync with the place because it's so big yeah and you've got to get out of your own way as well because i think yeah. some people they, they get overwhelmed and they they'll flit around too much they'll doubt themselves they won't stick to their guns and i think that can work against you on a place like that yes definitely definitely um yeah, so I went on there. It was about 120 acres. Um, it had a dam wall one end. Probably, I don't know, probably 100 carp in there, maybe less. So, it's yeah. Um, I think in the 90s, it actually held the Pike British record, um, which I think was 44 and a half pound. Yeah, that's a big fish. Yeah, it used to be a trout. Used to, they stocked trout in there back in the day. Um, right. And, and you know, anywhere with you know any trout reservoir seems a whole massive pipe, don't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's still got a handful of decent pike in there now, but not like it used to be. All the trout are long gone. The pike have annihilated them, uh, and then a lot of sort of the, the foreigners have, have annihilated the pike. You know, um, and it's been odds to death. So who knows really how many carp was in there? But I fished on there for a season. Um, and and it was completely different. Um, what I would do is I would ride my bike around there for a day or two before I'd fish. I would never fish blind. I think what a lot of people would do, they'd turn, there was a couple of comfortable swims near mm. near one of the free car parks that you could park the car, walk 50 yards, and you'd come to a nice big open swim on a grassy bank. Um, and it was called convenient and comfortable, and no one really caught like that you know uh, uh, and I would always make sure that I rode my mountain bike around the lake for a day or two before before I'd even contemplate fishing because mm. um, I was I felt like you was just an, like a needle in a haystack and then it was sort of pre pre baiting really um, yeah pre baiting and and just I, I, I'd go around and, and pre bait you know, half a dozen likely looking areas um, in, in little bays and little fingers and stuff like that. Um, and I actually, I actually had, I don't know how I'd done it, but I ended up having nine carp out of there um, to just over 35 pound. And I didn't catch a single bream. Um, and a guy that uh, was, that was a friend of mine who fished it quite a lot alongside me, he was, um, he would get just ruined by the bream all night. You know, he'd catch, he'd have to go through 15 bream to catch a carp, you know? Yeah. And it was, it was soul destroying because it was so open and it was, yeah, it was, it was like the sea had a massive wind on it. It was horrendous um, getting up at two or three o'clock in the morning for a big snotty, you know? Um, yes, yeah, so I had about nine, nine fish off of there. Um, and for whatever reason, I didn't I didn't catch the the bream, and I think that was to do with the the rigs I was using. Um, I think mm. I was just using um, long hairs, really long hairs. And and you thought <clears throat> that was just like the hook wasn't getting in the mouth enough. Yeah, me and my mates mess about. We call it anti bream technology. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, long hair, like a two inch hair. Have you gone down the route of like a, a, a double 30 miller or anything like that? I've done that in the past in places like Belgium. Mm. Um, Why not I, the UK? Um, I've never really felt the need. I, I, I think you, when you use massive gobstoppers, I mean, I mean, long story short, I've caught more fish over the years, more big fish on tiny hook baits than I have. So yeah. I think. I think there's a, a definitely an edge there with a small group it, it, I think it's more replicative. Is replicative even a word? I don't fucking know. It, um, it represents natural food it, items. Exactly. It represents natural food way more than, than like a big one. But if we're going on waters that are seeing boilies, which let's be honest, they're not natural, are they? Yes, they have the same food signals as some of their natural foods, but they're not natural. If we're going on somewhere like that, I think, being so different and going for like a 30 mil bait. Yes. I'm a big fan of big baits. I'll roll up my, most of the time I'm using big baits. Um, and yeah, I totally agree with you. It's natural to have a, 
excuse me, smaller food items. But I think as well, like if you go the opposite end of the spectrum and just wang out a, a huge bait, they're just not used to it. And particularly if you're into pre-baiting, I really want to talk about pre-baiting with you in, in a little bit. I know you've still got more to go, but um, yeah. Anyway, carry on, mate. Um, yeah, so I managed nine carp out there, so about thirty-five pound. Um, I think some of them fish have been in there since the sort of the seventies. Incredible, mate! What year? When were you on there? How long ago was this? Um, five five years ago. Yeah. Um, it was just the sort of a stopgap, really, until I got my um, my next ticket. Um, yeah, but I, I've done I've done better out there than expected, and I was doing. Um, cause like I say, when I first went on there, um, it was quite daunting because it, 120 acres, it doesn't sound that big, but that's, that's a, it's pretty big, mate. When you stand there, it's like the sea, it's like the North Sea. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I, I caught all of my fish pre-baiting basically. Um, I was pre-baiting actually, like you say, with, with 20 millers. Mm. Um, but I would never use like a double 20 miller on the hook. My, my friend had tried that. And he was still managing to, to catch bream. Um, and that was like locusts in there. You know, you'd have you'd have bream sort of 16, 17, 18 pound, massive bream. Um, and I was just using long hairs and I, I touched wood, I never I never caught a bream. I'm not so that was a stopgap until I went on to um, another another venue that I was waiting for a ticket on. Um, but what was we saying? We were talking about pre-baiting, wasn't we? You said you wanted to pick my brain. I'd like to talk to you about pre-baiting, yeah. Um, I don't get the luxury of having the time to do it these days, but it's something I've done a lot in the past. And it's, <clears throat> I think it's uh, it's the reason I've caught, you know, the, the fish that I have caught in the past, to be honest with you. Are you are you going to the effort of, of pre-baiting regularly? What are your thoughts on it? What are you doing um, with it? Well, like I said, I would never a, a, a large venue like that. I would because it was very hard to locate the fish. I would I would never fish blind. I would always go down there the day before and put the, the mountain bike in the back of the car and then ride around the lake um, for maybe for just for two or three hours. Really, I'd see where people was fishing. Not that I mean, there's more pike anglers on there than carp anglers. But um, I would look for shows, and most of the shows you'd see was at last light. And you'd see like 20 or 30 or 40 bream roll over in twilight. And just occasionally you'd see a carp stick his head up amongst them. Um, again, it's back to them little tells that most people don't kind of capitalise on. Yeah. You know, you'd sit there of an evening. I'd sit there and uh, with a flask or something, can you sit there and you have a cup of tea and you'd watch all these bream, you know, rolling over at last light and at first light. And it was uh, you kept you kept watching, and occasionally you'd see a big carp just throw it, you know, stick its head out amongst them, amongst the silhouettes of the bream. Um, and then I would sort of make a beeline there for the next day if I could. Uh, most of it was kind of overnighters, but in between the overnighters, like I say, I would ride it ride it on a bike, see what I see, and then I would stick in. Um, I would pre bait with boilie basically. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've always been in a, in a sort of a privileged position where I've always um, been affiliated with with one type of bait company over the years. So I was either getting a bait for nothing or, or paying very little for it, you know. Um, and I've got two chest freezers in the garage and I can, at any one time, I've probably got 100 kilos of bait around me. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I'd stick in, yeah, I, I wouldn't think nothing of sticking in... Uh, five to ten kilo um three days a week um i know that's a luxury most people haven't got now with, with bait being so expensive and whatnot but and i think the longer you can pre-bait the better the longer you can leave it without fishing without having lines in 100 percent the better yeah. you know? mm. i mean what's what's your sort of theories on pre-baiting Oh, my theory is just like, do it as much as you can. And as you say, you know, leave it for as long as you can. <clears throat> I mean, you can, you can kill a spot. Obviously you can over bait. And if the carp aren't eating it all, then it can you know, obviously rot on the bottom. That's not good. You don't want that. Yeah. But yeah, presuming those fish are eating it. Yeah. I think 
as regularly as you can. You're again, you're conditioning them. You mentioned conditioning earlier from rigs. Yeah. Well, you can, you can, I mean, there's no easier way to to condition a fish other than with food, and that probably goes for any animal. Yes. So yeah, I think get the bait in as quick, you know, as often as you can. Um, yeah, it's like it, it makes fishing very, very easy. I feel like I'm cheating sometimes. In the past, when I've when I've really sort of I finished my working day and I've gone down the lake at like nine p.m. or something like that, put some bait in, came home. I'd I'd easily do that every other day, sometimes every day, and yeah, it takes a lot of work and yeah, other things sacrificed, but I almost feel like I'm cheating when I do go to fish because I've been putting that effort in. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, example of that actually going back to them pictures I sent you. If you go back through them pictures, there's a picture of me as a young man. You you, you know what I mean? I'm about nineteen, I think. Um, just just looking now. There's a picture of a big fat football shaped mirror. Forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've got it. Yeah, so I was about 19 there. Um, and that was actually the I think it was the second or third 40 pound that I ever caught. Um, and that was a li- another little place which was a, a farm, um, a, a farm, uh, de- a dairy farm basically. And it was a little irrigation pond and it was only about an acre. And had a handful of big carping which had just been left to their own devices, probably been in there 25, 30 years. Um, and it was sort of on my route home from work. And at the time I was riding a motorbike to work and it's back to that thing about mindset, like you were saying, putting the, putting the graft in and, and sort of going beyond what other people was up for doing, you know, um, the juice has to be worth the squeeze, doesn't it? But yeah. if, if you don't try, you don't, you don't know, do you? Um, and that was back to what you you were just saying. I pre-baited this place with with hemp and uh, chopped tigers for oh, probably six weeks, six weeks. I didn't. It was it was horrible. So I, I, I wanted to fish it and I didn't. And I I done it every other day on the way home with hemp and tigers. Um, and I had I'd have a bucket of hemp and tigers in my rucksack on a motorbike. And I'd go a different way home because I knew I could, it was about 10 miles out of my way, but I could go past this this, this dairy farm. Um, and I baited that place, yeah, heavily with hemp and tigers. And I, on the first trip down there, when I finally fished it after sort of six weeks, that was the first bite I had, 42 pounder. Um, and like you say, you, you're definitely conditioning them, aren't you? Um, and it, I guess it's like a farmer in the field, being a dairy farm, uh, it was funny because occasionally you'd see him walk over and he'd shake a bucket and all them cows would come from 10 acres away yeah. Yeah. to the corner of that field out of out of habit, right? Um, yeah, and then you'd get, the, you'd, they'd all rush over, but you'd get the odd cow, you know, which I sort of likened to a cart which would hold back and he, all the others would pile in and 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 eat, eat the, the food or the, the the pellets he was throwing in the in the in the hoppers um and i think they're like them then they sort of represent carp you know like the ones that abstain from feeding you know whatever you do you struggle to catch them do you feel that they are kind of preoccupied on other food sources or do you do you think maybe they're they're sucking and blowing in a different way feeding in a different way what what's your take on that no i i think um, you get the, you always get a mugfish, don't you, on most venues, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that one sort of weighs it up and it says, right, uh, uh, the juice is worth the squeeze. If I can eat five kilos of bait and get caught every now and again or once a month, it's, it, the juice is worth the squeeze. And then I think you get another carp, which which is big and it's, it's greedy, but he would rather have the food to himself. Mm. So he won't go in with the rest of the pack. If that makes sense, yeah. Have you have you seen kind of older or bigger fish hang back, let the youngsters feed first? Not and then it's almost like they get their their confidence up. Um, I have seen that, but I, for me, I, what I've seen more is is things like getting back to that lake with all the weed in. It had a couple of koi in there, mm. um, and you'd always see them koi. Like what would happen is you, you wouldn't. You'd, I'd be standing up on a, on a, on the upper tree trying to spot fish. And you'd see nothing. And you could see most of the lake, but there was tunnels under the weed and that kind of thing. Um, and then occasionally you'd see this fish come out. And we called it the carrot. 
You know, you see his bright orange coil. He's only probably 12 or 14 pounds. But as soon as you see him, it kind of tuned your eyes in. And then within 30 seconds to a minute, you'd see a couple of others, you know, the, the, the commons and the mirrors. Um, but you can never catch him. And again, koi has got, he had a smaller mouth and it was just the way he fed. Um, and yeah, he just always stayed on the back, on the, on the, on the back foot and he let the others go in. And, um, I witness him, I'd witness him feed a lot from up, up trees, but you'd, you'd rarely see him get caught. Um, yeah. And I think it, like you say, it was just the, the maybe, it, it, maybe he was, clever in the hours but I don't think it was that I just think certain fish are are, 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 are timid I guess yeah uh, yeah uh, and yeah and he, he rarely got caught and he had a small mouth as well so I think that helped him eject rigs yeah how in, big was he I don't know t- between 12 and 14 pound right yeah yeah you know, he had a bit of a fan tail and he looked like a bit of a, a, a mutant goldfish to be honest yeah so you can you can rationalize it with those, but we're when it's the big fish that just don't freaking get caught, you're like, well, they've got big through eating. They have to be. Yes. And they're, but they're not getting caught. Their body shape's similar to others. They're like they're probably, you know, feeding in the same way. It can screw your head screw with your head, can't it? It can with mine anyway. That's for damn sure. Yeah, well, I'm I'm currently at the a place at the moment like that. I won't mention the venue, but obviously yeah. I've had, this, I've had a big run of big fish. Yeah. And I'm currently chasing a couple of mid to upper 50 pounders. And, and yeah, as of yet, I, I can't bloody catch them. And it's now I'm now scratching my head thinking maybe it's the nature in what they feed. I'm, 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 I'm sort of thinking of going in the, I'm going to s- step up my hook size. I think, um, I had a 49 pounder a little while ago. Um, I think you see the fish. Um, yeah. It had a massive, massive mouth. It could, eat, it could eat a baked potato, you know, it wouldn't touch the sides. And I use a size four hook, uh, a big, strong size four, but it looked tiny in that fish's mouth. Yeah. Now, this was this was 49 pound. I mean, a, a massive fish by any standard, but the one that I'm after is probably 56 to 58 pound. Yeah. Now I'm thinking, you know, just relative to the size of the fish, maybe that's got an enormous mouth, and that little size four is just getting lost in there, and it's it's, yeah. it's yeah. doing me. Yeah. Um, I'm also thinking about lengthening my rigs because I, I figure it's got a big gut in the way. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, you know, they upright themselves, don't they? Before yeah, they massively. Like, yeah. Yeah. Rigs. Um, Who, who's using a long, supple hook length right now? He, Not he, many people. That, that was going to be my next thing. I mean, oh, okay. like you say, back to conditioning. Who who uses, I mean, we all grew up using it. I used to use a 12-inch a, a long piece of Dacron or a 12-inch mm. long piece of 25-pound Christ on silkworm. But who does that now? You know? Um, exactly. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm really thinking of this. If I haven't caught it by the time the new season's up, which is the end of March, I'm going to completely um, change my my rigs up, and I'm going to go with long, supple uh, hook links, like you say, twelve to fourteen inches. Um, yeah, bigger hook. I'm going to go to a size two. Yeah, yeah. A size in a big carp's mouth. I'm sure you've, you know, well, I know you've caught a lot of big carp. You look at the hook in it. Oh, yeah. yeah it's lost in these, the old fish, more the old fish where they're, mm. I mean, <clears throat> you've got these young grown, you know, these young, quick growing fish. Yeah, they can have smaller heads and smaller mouths. Look at the old fish that are big uh, and their mouths are freaking huge. A size four is nothing in there. I feel like I'm against the clock because, um, the fish I'm after is, I don't know, it's not not that old, but these sort of faster growing strains, you know, like yeah. these emo like, crosses, they don't seem to make old bones, do they? No. Um, and it's probably, I think it's about 23, 24 years old, this fish. Um, and I say the last, I mean, it's, it's, it's frustrating because I photographed it twice. You know, um, and the last time I see it come out, it was 55 and a half. 
which is obviously big a fish, mate. Right? Very awesome. big. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and recently I've had a big, I've had a big run of big fish in in winter, in sort of as you've seen yourself, sort of November, December. Um, I think I've had on my current syndicate, I've had uh, I've had twelve forties in nine months. Ridiculous. Which is yeah, it, it's even to me when you say it out loud like that, it's uh, yeah, it's um, nine months. Nine months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, three quarters of a year, and you, and you yeah, had... a dozen, a dozen forties, um, and six of those forties, so fifty percent of them have been over forty-five pound. Yeah, jeez, mate, that's crazy. Yeah, how many thirties? Um, I've had thirty-three different thirties in the last nine months. Yeah, I've had since I've joined because this is my first season on that syndicate. Um, I've had. 86 fish. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to be fair, I mean, you're you're obviously a, an excellent angler who's very dedicated. You're obviously, just, just for people thinking, fucking you know, I'll never catch so many, you're obviously fishing the waters that hold this amount of fish, which, which is a big part of it, isn't it? You can't catch yeah, what's not in front yeah, of you. Absolutely. Not to take anything away from you because you've done a phenomenal job, but... It, you know it it's um it's the whole like social media comparison game it, it, it's easy to get down on yourself looking at people who are just you know living amazing what well, seemingly amazing lives or catching loads of shit loads of huge fish you, you you've got to be in those circumstances to 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 benefit from those fruits haven't you yes but what you don't see is you don't see when i've been on a on, on a 15 night blank exactly no. Yeah, agree. Because no. no one posts that shit, do they? No, no. It's it's it's, it's a fickle thing, isn't it? Social media. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not on Facebook. I'm only on Instagram. Um, but yeah, you never see the defeats. Do you? I, I was on the phone to my friend today. who's a, a very very good angler. Uh, my friend Mike, one of the best anglers I've ever had the pleasure of fishing with. And if you look at his photo album on Instagram, it looks like he's out catching his big ones seven days a week. So what you, what you don't know is only us, us who are close to him. I mean, I was on the phone to him the other night and he was he was in the middle of doing a three-hour round trip to go and put bait in. Mm, exactly, yeah. And, and that, That's fucking dedication, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, the, the, the poor sod, I, I was out on the bank and I'd actually had, it was in that horrible storm maybe four or five weeks ago. We had torrential rain and, and sort of 50-mile-an-hour winds up in Essex. And uh, I was buzzing because I had I had six bites and I had um, a forty six pounder um, and then a forty eight pounder followed by four thirties. I had six bites. Um, it was only me on the lake, and I was absolutely buzzing. And um, I'm sending in voice notes on WhatsApp, you know, and I didn't even look at the time, and it was three o'clock in the morning. You know, I was just full of adrenaline. And I was buzzing because I had these these big ones in a sack, you know? Mm. And um, within sort of five minutes, I had a text back and the poor sod was doing a three hour trip um, down to a river because he'd been pre-baiting a river so for some big river carp. Um, and he was pushing his barra back in his pants, wet through to the skin, <laughs> walking back um, mm. on the riverbank where his bivy had got ripped out from him. Bivy folded in half. It was only in a shelter, and not a bivy, like a little, like a little a day shelter, really. You know, doing a quick overnight on this river, and the, the the weather was horrendous. And he's a big man, you know. What I mean, he's he's about six foot four. You know, what I mean, he's a big fella, and he was pushing his barra back in his pants, wringing wet through. Um, it, it had two bream or something, um, but no one hears about that today. Absolutely not. No. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what? It gives me like a good idea for like maybe a podcast series or something. Thing is, no one would want to listen to it. But um, yeah, like uneventful angling sessions. There's some someone could do, perhaps not a podcast, but there's something someone could do in in the angling media with that. I think. I think it would be good to show that side of angling. Do you not think? I think so, mate. Yeah, like it's real. Yeah, yeah. 
but like you say, people don't want to see that, do they? People, no. I mean, it's us, us hardcore anglers. That's definitely an audience for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about what about yourself and your angling? Have you had any sort of strange goings ons or anything like that in your angling? Strange in in terms of what, like wind ripping bivvies yeah. away, or I mean, like any like sort of spooky going ons or or having you. Yeah, I did a, we did a pod, we did like a Halloween special in, I don't know what year it was, 2020, maybe 2021. I don't know. I don't know. Was that, was that the one when you were, I think it was you or Pete were saying that there was dead rabbits on the path or something. It might have been that one. That was, that was Pete that had the dead rabbit thing. Yeah. He said there was two little rabbits left there on the path. Yeah. Which could be anything to be honest, but. But yeah, yeah, it might have, it probably was. I don't know what episode it was. We've got a lot of stories and I don't know what I can't I mean, I can't remember what we've shared and what we haven't, but yeah, if you're talking about like spooky ghost type things, yeah, I had a real fucking I had a terrible experience, mate, to be honest with you. Um, which I've I've spoke about on one episode. I think it was it would have been the spooky Halloween one. Um, don't know if it's the same episode as Pete mentioned the rabbits or not, but yeah, I've had some, uh, and I mean, the thing is I, like, we're, I don't know how many nights I've done in my life, but it's a hell of a lot. Um, possibly not as many as you because the, for many years I haven't been going out three or four nights, but I've, I've certainly had years where I've been doing that religiously every single week. Yeah. You're going to experience some shit, aren't you? Like yeah. you just are. I think that's one of the privileged things as an angler, isn't it? You get to see stuff that other yes. folks come in contact with. Yes, hundred ne- percent. Nature, nature-wise, definitely. You know, I've I've had foxes very near me, not knowing that I was there because, you know, the the wind has been blowing in the right direction, not to reveal my presence. Yeah. Uh, I've been. I don't. I just get countless stuff from nature. I love nature. You know, I'm 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 in awe of nature. You mm-hmm. know, animals and and just you know. I just everything I, I just freaking love it but yeah you're gonna get some weird shit happening and you know i've i've had some weird scenarios i've met some weird people and uh you know i've I've probably been the weirdo that that someone else has met as well if you know what i mean um yeah, yeah. I've had some strange occurrences yeah have you go on what what have you had um uh this um this very weedy lake that i was telling you about um like yeah. I say, beautiful during the day. Um, and over night, it's quite spooky. You hear like you hear like big owls and stuff, and um, like tawny owls, and you see badgers in the woods. And and when it's a horrible, dark, miserable night, and there's no moon, it's, it can be quite spooky because most of the time I was the only one there. Um, yeah, and it's sort of big, can be quite daunting, you know. And um, I I was fishing locked up with these big leads and. Um, uh, I'm a very, very light sleeper anyway. Um, and it was literally one bleep and you see the tip bending around and, and he, he, they're on, you know. Um, and I was having, I don't know what I think was, a, I don't know if it was a lucid dream, even to this day, I don't know if it was a lucid dream or not, but I remember waking up, well, I see a woman put her head in my bivy, a woman, dark figure, she stuck her head in my bivy door. Right. Um, and you know when you've been in that dream state when you're you're trying to wake yourself up you know you're you know you're asleep but you also realize that um you're in a bit of trauma you're aware yeah you're aware that you're asleep but you're you're also aware that it's it's quite traumatic and you're trying to wake yourself up Have you ever had that you know you know you're sleeping it's in between sleep and awake you know that little i have yeah yeah, and I, I I swear to this day I had a woman. She stuck her head in this bivy, and I and I sat bolt upright. And I actually woke myself up. You know, like talking in my sleep. I woke myself up, um, and she stuck her head in my bivy. And as I sat bolt upright, her head just dissolved, and there was nothing there. Mm. Um, yeah, just just I've had a, 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 you know a handful of strange things happen on the bank. To be honest. Um, and I don't know if it's as a carp angler, you, you sit up. Mo- I mean, I do anyway. I sit up most of the night and try and hear stuff. Um, back to that mindset thing, going doing things that other people don't do. And um, and on my current syndicate, where I've been catching all them 
them them big uh, them big ones from. Uh, most people have got these bloody great bivvies and they've got a TV in them and they're watching the football and you know it's a uh, it's not a bit of me put it that way. No, you know, you no, feel- it's like they do. Like you're in an amazing place. You're at a lake in nature, away from all the freaking grind and bustle of daily life but it's like they have to get back to that and there's nothing wrong i'm not i'm not shitting over those people like do what you want fishing is different to different it means different things to different people doesn't it but yeah yeah, i'm probably like you i want to get out in nature and experience something different from the daily grind of life yeah definitely i mean i've I've had a couple of things (laughs) wherever there's big Big fish, there's a it's always busy, isn't it? Most places are busy. My, my place is very busy. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd go during the week and I'd go, I'd go on a Sunday night. You know, most people are going back to work and I'd do overnighters and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know your experience with that, but I've had I've had a couple of incidents where I've literally been followed, been back to that thing of walk, I've been followed around the lake by certain anglers, you know, and I remember. Um, fishing and being in, a, in, in the first room in the car park and it's like a little bay and the fish are either in there in numbers or they're not. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the shape's like um, egg-shaped almost. So it's about 10 acres. Um, so you've got either end, even narrow end. Um, so the car park swim is the, is the shallower end. It's probably, when I say shallower, in the summer it's probably nine foot. But the rest of the, the, the deep end is 23 foot, you know. So it warms up quicker. And they're either in there in numbers or they're not. So I've had a lot of fish out of out of these two swims at the end in the shallower water. Now, I remember um, I'd be the only person there on a Sunday, on Sunday afternoon. Everyone had gone home and I'd, I'd be turning up just as people had been leaving. And I found these fish, you know, and, 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 I, and I was fishing kind of, three or four wraps out under the, almost under the rod tips, you know. Um, and there was a, a couple of anglers that they offer the back of my success, offer the back of my graft, my hard work back to the stuff that people don't see. People don't yeah. see blanking and the, you know, a dozen nights of not having a bleep. Um, they kind of almost followed me around the lake. And I ended up pulling up with guy one day and saying, listen, mate, what's the, what's the matter? Are you scared of the dark? He went, no, what are you talking about? I said, well, so we've got 10 acres of water here. Why, why are you following me around the lake? And his exact words was, he goes, well, if the fish weren't here, Dale, you wouldn't be here. And I just thought, oh, God. Mm. Um, and that's, that's that's another bit of, of carp fishing nowadays, isn't it? it? It used to be that you was, put, you know, pissing your wits up against the carp, but now it's it's against the other anglers as well. Do you not think? Most definitely. Yeah, you you got to tackle it from two angles, haven't you? The carp and then what everyone else is doing. And yeah, it's sad. I mean, I'm lucky I don't <clears throat> I don't fish mega busy venues, but still, like these fish are getting fished for, and they've been caught multiple times, many, many times. And you have to understand again, going back to what you said earlier, these they're conditioned animals, and you have to bring in. For me. I am a bit of an OCD head as well. I think you said that earlier. Maybe you didn't. Maybe I imagined that. But I have to bring into consideration everything. I have to look at everything from every angle. And it can get quite obsessive. But I think it helps catch fish for sure. Um, But yeah, it's just... It's not what it used to be. And I mean, again, did a lot of my carp angling in Cornwall, which isn't, you know, exactly booming for fishing. There's Where, no... I mean, I love Cornwall. Whereabouts in Cornwall? I mean, I spent a lot of time as a kid down in Penzance fishing with my dad. Yeah, it's a bit more southern than I ever lived. Yeah. Um, but I used to fish all over, literally all over. Um, parents moved to to a village near Tintagel. Yeah. And then I uh, and then I moved I moved out near nearish to Newquay and fished all over Cornwall basically and Devon as well. There's some there's some good non fishing lakes, but like you know old pits in Devon which which held some some nice carp. Nothing massive or anything like that, but some nice carp. But yeah, I fished all over there. Um, yeah, definitely it's a beautiful part of the country. Oh yeah, beautiful. Yeah, very beautiful. 
yeah, I'm up in the Cotswolds now, which is where I I grew up. Um, you're um, you're fishing at Cotswold Waterpark, aren't you? Amongst some other places, yeah, yes, yeah. So again, another another nice part of the country, isn't it? It is, yeah, and I, and I grew up here, and you know, I, I used to ride my bike around the Cotswold Water Park when I was a kid, little kid, and uh, you know, looking at these lakes and these anglers. I I came into carp angling later than a lot of people. Um, I didn't start fishing for carp until I, I think I was nineteen, um, but I fished for for other species before that. Um, well, I, think um, you're, I think if you're an angler, you're an angler, aren't you? It doesn't. Necessarily... Yeah, yeah. There's definitely. I mean, there's different types of angling for sure, but. I'm glad that I fish for other species before I fish for carp, I think, in this day and age. And again, not knocking it, do whatever the fuck you want, you know. But there's a lot of people that start with carp. And yes, yeah. that, maybe I'm just old fashioned, but that seems backwards to me. I don't know. It just doesn't seem right. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. But it's that back to that old thing, isn't it? Watercraft and, yeah. and learning your surroundings. I mean, Getting back to what we were saying about little little tells, little signs that have made the biggest difference in my angling. Um, yeah. I'll give you an example. Me and my dad, when I was about 16, 17, used to fish this um, little day ticket up in Suffolk. Um, and it had some big fishing, I'd say mid 30 pounders. Um, and it was only about an acre. Again, then them places can be kind of finicky, you know, the... You can't get a bite here, but you can get a bite six inches off the spot, you know. And uh, I remember going down there once and there'd been three or four lads there. And, and if it was three or four lads there, that was busy because that was, I think there was only about six swims on the lake. Um, and I remember walking around um, and I spoke to the lads and they said, oh, I've been here four days, I haven't had nothing. And it was red hot, red hot. And um, as I, I creep around this corner, back to that old thing, watercraft, you know, picking up your feet and, and, and a good pair of Polaroids and just having a, an inkling of where they're going to be given the, the, the environment, the, the weather, um, you know, that if it's hot, they're going to be in a, probably going to be in a shallow part of the lake, getting the most of the sun, etc. Um, and these lads um, hadn't had nothing for days and uh, they were just starting to pack up. I remember setting up in this little corner, one rod, and uh, I could just see fish sort of mouthing the scum, and no one else had clocked it. No one else had clocked it. And I remember having a, just getting a, a little piece of bread on a, just on a, on a bare hook, you know, free lined, um, and just I dipped it in, you know, so it just slowly sink, and I was just flicking it amongst this, this, um, this scum. Um, and I end up having a bite within within three or four minutes of putting this this uh, this rod out, um, a nineteen pounder. And the lads come rushing over, and and um, they couldn't believe it. They'd been there three or four days, and there was this sort of young lad, you know, and these grown men, and I was about sixteen. Um, and I remember doing the photo stuff, putting that fish back, and and uh, a couple of hours I'd spent. I was only down for the evening. And I remember walk, you know, pack the stuff up, walking back to the car, back, you know, before the days that you had barrows and stuff, you know, lugging all your gear back. And there was a few cherry trees around the lake. And as I walked back around to the to the little bridge that you crossed to go to the car park, under this cherry tree was, you could see three or four silhouettes, you know, like ghosting on top of the gravel. Mm -hmm. um, and no one, had, no one had clocked them. And, um, I ended up getting me getting my rod out, and uh, and I had uh, on the rod I had a leg clip and stuff on it, and I remember taking the lead off, leaving the leg clip on and the leg core, and and I think obviously it was a, it was a snake skin hook bait. Do you remember that Christ on snake skin? I do. Yeah, I used to use that a lot. Yeah, me too. One of my favourite hook uh, hook lengths, and I still had the hair and everything on, and I remember reaching up and grabbing a cherry from this cherry tree, and I thinking I just thought to me, I wonder. I wonder if they're sitting under here because they're eating the, the falling fruit, you know. Anyway, I grabbed this uh, this cherry, popped the pip out of it, you know, half this cherry, put it straight on the on the on the size six, and uh, left left the hair on there, just hooked it on, and just flicked it out with with the leg clip, but with no lead, and it fluttered down, and bang, this fish grabbed it, and I had a thirty seven pounder. Mm. Um, and yeah, when I think back, I, I could name you half a dozen situations like that when the tiniest little tells have resulted in me having these 
mega fish. Yeah. It's 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 often the little things that like if you're not watching, if you're not engaged in the water, you're gonna miss those things, aren't you? Yeah, which is what I why I can't get my head around these these boys and they sit there and they've got their bivy table and they've got their TV and they're watching the football and the doors seven o'clock, the doors zipped up. But but that is a good oh, that's, that's a good night for them. And there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Uh, no, absolutely. If you want to get away from the wife or the missus and have a few days and yeah. a couple of beers on a bank, yeah, I'm yeah. all. Um, but the the thing that tickles me is when people, uh, it's happened on the place I'm at the moment. People will come round to me and I say, "God, you've you've been having it off, haven't you?" And I'm always, I say as little as a can of so I've had a couple. And then one bloke said to me, um, "That fish you had earlier looked big in the binoculars." I hmm. went, what you know, and they're watching me with binoculars. Yeah, you know, but but what they're not like we said again, what they're not watching is when I've been on a fifteen night blank. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm I'm packing a wet bivy up and I'm going home soaking wet and freezing cold, and yeah, I've run out of fresh socks and I'm stinking and I haven't had a bite for days. Yeah, this is like everything that you're saying about this. I just can't. I can't relate to because it's just my idea of hell. And I know you've, you've done, yeah. I don't know if you want to name some of the waters you've fished or not, but I know you've done some of the circuit waters and it's part of the freaking game on those waters, isn't it? Yes. Whoever's catching more than the other people, like there's eyes on them. The binoculars are on them. I've had it to a degree, to be honest, but, but not like, not like you'd get on those kind of waters because I don't fish waters that busy. It's just, it just turns me off. But well, I, I, the, the water that I'm currently on, I went on there um, because I wanted a UK 50. And I knew there was, you know, right time of the year, three or four 50s in there. Um, and it's, a, it's an expensive ticket. Um, anyway, so I got a ticket, long story short, got a ticket. Turn up there, and it's it's uh, not the most picturesque place, and it's very open to to the elements. It's, it's up high; it's an irrigation reservoir. Um, very clear, crystal clear water. Like I say, about twenty three feet deep, uh, one end, and about you know, given the right time of year, um, and about it's probably about fourteen foot average over most of the lake. Um, but you, you can see every swim from anywhere on the lake. Um, like I say, it's an irrigation reservoir, so it's lifted up high, and you're you're kind of above the trees, you know. So it's good from a, a, a fish spotting point of view because you can you can see anything you can see show you can sort of capitalise and move on it. Um, but obviously, if you can see that, other anglers can see you. Um, and I went on there just out of the because uh, I wanted a UK fifty, um, and then I went on there and. Uh, Believe it or not, the first night I, I went on there with no information. I had, a, I, I had a friend on there, and he'd had a handful of fish out. Nothing, nothing really big. I think the biggest he'd had was about forty pound. Um, so he got me the ticket, um, and yeah, I went on there. And I think I went on there. It was I think it was the fourth of April. Uh, this was last year, um, and he said it's not a very picturesque place, but I knew the stock in it was phenomenal. Um, and I've done a couple of nights and I didn't have nothing for the first night and I just stuck out hinges um, with some handmade hook baits I've made which actually was um, them garlic hook baits um, and anyway on the on the second night so the first session the first bite I had was a was a fish that was 48 pound um, which sort of just blew me away and um, and I actually sent you a video, didn't I? I sent you like a quite a professional video that was done. You did, yeah. Yeah, that was that fish. That was the first bite I had. Um, and I think it was, uh, yeah, almost 48 pound. It was just a, yeah, it was a, a PB and a mega, a mega fish. Uh, and it's actually the best, the hardest fight in carp still to this day I've ever caught. Um, yeah, and, and I, Looking at the place, I never thought it'd kind of get a hold of me, but it, it's really kind of got a hold of me because I know the stock that's in there. Mm. And it's almost like, okay, it's not picturesque and it's not pretty and it is busy, but 
but it's just the place that gives you butterflies because you know what you can potentially catch every time the rod goes off. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like it's like Jurassic Park for car fishing. You know, it's just uh, yeah, a mega place. And yeah, you know, I've had some 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 really yeah fabulous catches out of there, and I've done particularly well. Um, like I say, I've had eighty six fish this season. I think I've had 32, 32 30s. I think I've had a dozen 40s, um, six over 45 pound. Um, but yeah, it just kind of gets older. It sort of crept up on me, really. Um, yeah, just because of the fish are so big. And, and it's not one of them places where you can watch the fish feed or anything like that. A lot of it's uh, it's clear water, but there's, there's not much edge fishing um, because you can... I think because you silhouette so easily against the bank because it's like an irrigation reservoir. So the fish spend most of the time out in sort of open water. Uh, we had a, a massive amount of weed this year. Um, and for somewhere you'd think would be pretty easy, it's not at all. It's it's, it's way harder than than you'd, you'd imagine it to be. And I imagine that the f- average... Average catch, average fish a year for the average angler on there is probably, I don't know, 30 fish a year. Um, and for whatever reason, I've just managed to do really well. I don't know if that's by luck or by judgment. Um, but like I say, I'm still chasing a, a couple of 50 pounders. And I've sort of given myself, I, I'd like to catch them over the winter. Mm. Wouldn't we all? I'd like to catch another winner. Oh, of course, yeah. No, the ultimate goal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done, as you know, I've done really well recently. I've had uh, over sort of November and December. I think I've had I've had nine different forties over November and December. I just recently had a big, a big, a big fish hit, didn't I? Um, on the first of December, I had uh, fourteen bites. Um, I landed fourteen. Um, didn't drop any, which I was amazed about. I had, I think, eight or nine thirties, and I had, I mean, a session of a lifetime, best session I've ever had to date. It was, I had a hat trick of upper forties. I had a, a forty-eight pound four ounce mirror, um, one of the eighteen. Um, then I had a forty-seven one, uh, a mirror, real long fish or a plated mirror. And uh, then I finished it off with uh, another named fish, which was £49.1, which still just blows my mind, absolutely blows my mind. And, and I remember sort of like, you know, like, like you do actually a good one, you message your friends, don't you? You give them a WhatsApp, whatever. And I was still to this day, I say it out loud, it's, a, it's a, a session of a lifetime. And I don't think that will probably ever be, won't, won't be better for a while, you know, especially in that, that time of the year. Um, and 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 was it something Carl was doing, or was it the fact that I was just on fish? I mean, we're never really going to know, mate, are we? But no, that's the beauty of it, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So I'm still chasing these these fish, and yeah, I'm sort of working my ass off to try and try and catch them. I'm I'm thinking of getting out Monday, uh, but I know we've got a bit of bad weather coming in Monday, haven't we? <clears throat> we have, yeah, this weekend, yeah. It's Friday uh, as we record this. Coming in Monday, apparently snow, isn't it? Oh shit! Do you know I've just realised. Well, Friday oh, the thirteenth. Yes, you, you're right, mate. Yeah, I just, just <laughs> I didn't know that until I just looked at my phone. There you go. Yeah. Spooky, spooky happenings on the bank. Yeah. When um when are you out next? Uh, I'm hoping Wednesday. Okay. Um, when I say out, I mean it's literally a day session. Is it? I am. I I've gone. I mean, years gone by. I used to be out sort of three or four nights a week at, at certain times um religiously you know i wouldn't miss it for anything um but no now i'm i'm so fucking time poor it's it's unreal so yeah i'll probably i'll, I'll get to the lake for first light um and just i will walk that water because i can only i can only be there in daylight hours yeah. so i will just walk it and walk it and walk it religiously i won't cast out if i don't see anything yeah. Um, I just, I just won't do it. Yes, I can have a pretty good idea where the cart might be, but I just, I need, for for a session like that, I need to know where they are. Um, and then obviously, 
use a bait that I'm very, very confident in and and that's how I'll do it. So yeah, Wednesday for me, mate, and it's just a day session, unfortunately. Uh, I think during this time of year, a, a day session is probably the way to go. I think the last, the last kind of 15 bites I've had um, have all been daylight bites. Yeah. It'd be interesting to sort of pick your brains. What's your opinion on, on that? Um, do you think it's light levels? What, what do you think? Going- yeah, it can, it can be, to do with dissolved oxygen as well if it's a weedy water um yeah that was, definitely... that, was, that was my fear on that weedy water that all the bites was at first light yeah that's I really common it was, it was the weed started photosynthesizing and making oxygen yeah as well as that they they need an abundance of oxygen to actually digest the food so i think yeah. the carp can preempt they're masters of their environment but i think they can preempt okay well this is the time of day where i'm going to get a lot of oxygen that's going to enable me to digest this food more efficiently. Therefore, I'm going to have my gut filled by X time because I know I can digest it more efficiently. I yeah. really think that they, the animals engage in that kind of behavior. I, I just do. They an, animal. You've got to remember animals are so much more in tune with nature and what works in their favor and against their favor than we are because we're, we're just modernized, aren't we? Yeah, you know, we're, we're too much domesticated, aren't we? Just... We're domesticated. We're diluted, really, by freaking technology and the way, you know, we humans have just strive. Sorry, I'm ranting now, but humans have just strive to make everything so fucking comfortable for ourselves, haven't we? Oh, yes, that's so... great in many ways. In other ways, it's not fucking great, and it's taken us away from our roots, and it's softened us and you know blah 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 blah, blah. but yeah. yeah i think i can't know when they're gonna digest things more efficiently or they'll eat around it for sure yeah yeah i mean the the bites on the, my place at the moment um they're all first light um they've been that way for for months to be fair months it hasn't done a nighttime bite for is that not changed now now it's the cold water is that not changed at all is, is the window not shifted no, it's done. It hasn't done a, a nighttime bite since the late summer, really. Right. Um, and I, 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 I had an inkling it was to do date to light levels. Um, it's very, very weedy. This summer, it was it was floor to ceiling. It was horrendous. In fact, right, um, which was quite good because it put a lot of people off, you know. Um, and uh, I don't know what your sort of take is on on clear spots and, and fishing the weed but it's a very bait boat dominated water um and i'm not a bait boat angler I, you know they just don't do it for me but everybody on there has got one of these super duper boats you know two and a half three and a half grand boats uh fish finders you know um ipads with all the you know yeah lock. just yeah, yeah for me it's it's a bit a bit too far <clears throat> and but i've 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 casted. I've been I've been casting all year, you know. So uh, all I would all I was doing, I say all, it was kind of an edge because I was the only one doing it. Everyone was taking their boat out and they got they got their sonar and a GPS and they're looking for a clear spot and they're finding a little hole in the weed and you know um, they're dropping their bait and and uh, like I say, average was probably thirty. 30 fish a year for most people. Um, so I've, I've been casting all year and my approach has been little solid bags. I think I'll say I've had 86 fish and I've had at least 70 of them on solid bags. Mm, interesting. And Why is that, do you think? I think it's because of the amount of attraction you can put in a solid yeah. bag. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. For me, it's a massive edge. Yeah. I, for me, I think it's the if I could only fish with one method for the rest of my days, it would be a solid bag. Really? Yeah, hmm. yeah. I mean, you, I mean, you tell me you're you know more about the bait side of it than me. Um, I, I think it's just, just because of you can deliver the ingre- the soluble ingredients in, in a way that you can't with other rigs. I mean, what, what what's your take on it? I I agree with you. It, it, again, it you're you're giving yourself the opportunity to put things in there that you wouldn't otherwise. I mean, 
you're just fishing with boilies. I think that can have a, a an advantage, to be honest, with spread baiting, etc. But that's more to do with the baiting patterns. But in terms of what you can actually get in terms of attraction and gustation, like taste, yes, uh, a, a PVA bag is it's hard to bait. You know, it is really hard to beat. Um, you're trying to put all that into a boilie. Well, it needs to roll. It, it needs to stay together. It, you, you've got parameters you have to work with. Whereas with a PVA bag, pretty much put whatever you want in there. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's my opinion. I mean, what, what kind of thing are you putting in your solid bags? What's your perfect solid bag? Um, if you can tell me that without giving too much away. No, I can do. At the minute, what I'm doing is, uh, and again, I don't want it to sound like I'm just like plugging things, but I just use the Hydro Milk base mix um, in a in a in a PVA bag, and it's got <laughs> it, it's that mix is very different in a PVA bag because it's not boiled compared to where when it is where it's made into a bait, obviously, um, and obviously it's designed to be rolled into a paste ball and then boiled, like you know what we yeah. call a boily uh, and obviously it has different attributes to to capitalize on the process of that but it still works really fucking well in a pva bag so to be honest this winter if i use a bag and at the minute i'm using them on on every chuck i'll use a bag um and it's just got the hydro milk base mix in and, and that's it and then a very high tracked hook bait over the top um so most of the time i'm using my yet yeah, i've just the 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 black current um hook baits that we've got which is based off our black current ea which are you know very well known those are um, the, the black bukus aren't they yeah black buku yeah black black is short for black current and yeah. then it's got shit loads of a very good quality buku essential oil skunk oil in it yeah. um so yeah i'm using those all the polar fruits are very good I'll happily put either of those on. Um, got the 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 pine. It, it's it's painful for me, <laughs> but um, pineapple and organic acids. I mean, is such a fucking fantastic combination. It's been done to death. I mean, what what bait company hasn't done a pineapple and embryotic acid hook bait? Fucking everyone. But yeah, oh, with anything though, there's levels, isn't there? Oh um, yeah, there's levels. Oh yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, you know, there's, there's carp and there's carp, isn't there? And there's a yeah, um, yeah. I um, I totally agree. I get into organic acids. I put um, one of the things I, I do put in my pineapple uh, cork balls. I make. I put embuteric acid and I put Bragg's apple cider vinegar in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and that's been a, a winner for me. There's some acids in there. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're aware of them. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some some yeah. organic acids in there, isn't there? It's next yeah. this real cloudy one, and I take it for like gut health. I've got a big bottle of it, and it clouds up, and I shake it, and I take a, a tablespoon of that a day for gut health. Um, yeah, and I put that. I've been putting that in my pop ups and my wafters for years, and uh, yeah, it, 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 for me, it's a it just definitely works, definitely. Yeah, for sure. I mean. Yeah, it's and do you know what as well? Like, yes, we can get very technical on bait and things. Confidence is another one. If you find a bait that you're really confident in and you're confident in your approach, again, that makes you that kind of gives you an edge in itself because you're kind of you're angling with more intent and more conviction than perhaps someone is that, that you know, they're doubting what they're doing and they're sort of dilly dallying. I know that sounds a bit ambiguous, but it's true. You know, if you're confident in what you're doing, yes, this works. Yes, that works. My rig's good. My bait's good. Do you know what I mean? It, it's yeah, well, you, you can you can improve things from that, can't you? There's nothing. I mean, one of the few things I, I don't do, I never sit there. And if I haven't had a bite for three, two, three, four days, I never question my bait. I know I've got decent bait. I know my rigs work. Um, I, 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 it's just one of the things I never question. I never question my bait. Um, more often than not, it's location. I think that's that's uh, most of the puzzle. You've got to be on the fish. Um, but you know the, the, the watercraft thing. A, a few little things I was doing different was, like I said, that a lot of the eighty five percent of the boys on the syndicate are using these super duper boats. And yes, they have their place. 
back. I can't afford a two and a half brown boat. You know, I just can't. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and uh, you know, a lot of people can't. So I was just chucking solid bags, and um, it was it, in the beginning of the year, spring and summer. It was it was ridiculously weedy. Um, and they was all out with their sonar finding these clear spots. And I kind of think that they was fine. It was too blatant. And what I was doing, I was tying up three solid bags. Um, and in my bags, I was putting um, some little uh, one and two mil pellets. Um, also some dust that I was crushing up, some, some pellets myself. I was uh, injecting the bags with uh, garlic oil that I've made myself. Um, I was putting a little bit of uh, pink Himalayan rock salt in the bags. Mm. One of my favourite hook links, uh, sorry, one of my favourite hook baits, and my hook link was about about five inches long. That's kind of the length I've come up with for the, the best hook holds for a, a fish of about 30 pounds. Right. Um, I don't know if that's a bit longer than most people use. I mean, I, I, I normally see people using three to four inches. I think a bigger fish, you need a little bit more length to... to to, to get in the back of the mouth due to the nature of what they feed, how they feed. But yeah, particularly if they're upending. Yeah, yeah. If they straighten up, then they hit the lead. Yeah. Don't. yeah. Um, and I was just casting. And and what I would do, I'd make these three bags up and I'd lean up against the bivy and I wouldn't fish during the day and I'd wait for the fish to show at night. And I'd only cast at night, as, as, as anal as that sounds. Um, and I'd be on last light. Because I'm sure they can see that. I mean, I use use the sort of twenty pound fluorocarbon. I'm sure they can see it. I don't. I, I, I'm sure they they can. I don't care what fluorocarbon you've got. I'm sure they can see it. They know when there's lines in the water, don't they? It, it's. I mean, fluorocarbon is great until it picks up a load of shit, and yes, then it's exactly. like a fucking laser beam. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And unless you're winding your fluorocarbon through through a, a bit of clean rag or a bit of spun, yeah, yeah, it's it's null and void, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just casting solid bags at night, um, injecting them with with uh, this, this garlic oil that I made on on the rapeseed base, and uh, yeah, I'd sit up, um, and I think you, your ears are as as important as your eyes. You know, I I remember uh, this year, just after spring, actually, I heard a fish. Um, I say I'm a very light sleeper, and I heard a fish show close. And it, 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 it larried out two or three times. And with that, I wound my right hand rod in, tied a fresh bag. It done it a full time. I couldn't see it because it was pitch black, but I heard it. You know, I knew it was, you know, within about 40 yards. And I sort of put a bag on, in, on, on it within the, in, in, within the vicinity. And uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a bite an hour later, you know, 39 pounder. Um, and that's a bonus fish I would have never have caught because the, the other rods was motionless all night. Yeah. Um, so I think that this for me though those are, are definite edges you know casting at night um, a little par sort of bait I mean I wasn't too I wasn't I wasn't trying to find the, trying to find a clear spot I, you know I, I've got a marker float rod but I, I, it's not in my rod bag yet. I don't use it I don't use it I think that's one of the biggest fish scarers known to man yeah I mean what's your what's your take on that um, do you- I, I I don't I would do it if I wasn't fishing. So if I yeah. came onto a new lake um, and I couldn't use a boat and I wanted to figure out the topography, so like the lay of the, the the land as far as the bottom goes, yeah, I'd use one. But I wouldn't go and like smash a freaking marker float out there for an hour and then cast a bait over on a quick overnighter, you know? I yes. just wouldn't freaking do it. Yeah, yeah. So you, you mean you, kill it. you say that kind of blase, like that's common knowledge, but it isn't because... I see people time and time again every week doing that. Every week, honestly, Sam, it's, it's mm. for me, it's crazy. But I, I, I see it, and I, I, I sort of bite my bottom lip, and I'm in. Oh, I just, I can't believe my eyes. They come down for a night after work. They put a marker float out. They have fifty casts. Then they get the spot out. They put out twenty spawns, twenty five spawns. Then they put three rods out, and they mess a cast up. It, and the time they're all sorted for bed, they've had fifty casts. Yeah. And I just think you've completely ruined your chances. Um, and I, for me, I think the biggest edge in the two biggest edges in carp fishing, to, in my opinion, is time and 
if you can fish for them fish and they don't know you're fishing for them, that's a massive edge. Oh, yeah. You know, if that makes sense. Um, it does. Yeah, uh, they're so much more catchable, aren't they, on the basic of the rigs and the and, and the basics of bait if they don't know they're being fished for. And uh, I think that's why casting at night has done me well. Um, and uh, a lot of big fish venues, uh, people have this kind of attitude, well, you know, there's 50 pounds in here, they must eat loads of bait. I... I, I I, you know, it's that old thing, isn't it? Elephants eat peanuts. And I think the worst thing, mm. the worst thing you can do on a pressured venue is stick a load of bait in. I think the metabolic rate is factors in, doesn't it? For sure. I mean, yeah, slower metabolism. You mean they put weight on easier down to a genetic yeah. disposal? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And as they get older, I think that slows naturally. Yeah, like 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 us. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I just think um, that's most people's takes on places like Grenville. You know, there's, there's loads of 40 pounders in here. And they go in there and they pile 10 kilos in and don't do a bite. To me, that just screams people and it screams trap, you know? Yeah. The thing is, every you you picked up on a great point earlier. Like, everyone's very technical these days in terms of their actual rigs the sharpness of their hook, the mechanics. Um, they're all doing the same shit though, aren't they? Like, yeah. Most yeah. people are doing the same, the same fucking shit. Spomming. Yeah. yeah. Is one, oh, is one example. Um, I don't own a spom. I, I do not own a spom. I, I, I own a spom, but I don't use it. <laughs> I'm yeah. the same as you. I just, I just do not use it because. I can't bear it. That's what everyone's using. Yeah. It's just not like if you're just fishing with boilies, spread them about. Uh, maybe use big baits. Like I said earlier, I know you're not a fan of this and I agree with you about small baits. I really do. I think Carpa, they're much more willing to feed on small food particles. Yeah. Um, but I think go into the extreme of, if you're fishing a water that sees a lot of angling pressure, go into the extreme of what people don't do is generally the way to go. There's, there's generally scope there, you know, and, Obviously, there's exceptions to the rule. Don't go stupid. Um, but, yeah, I, I think there's things that can be done. I mean, I'm sure you've seen this in over your angling career. Um, you're on, you know, you go to like a pressure day ticket or somewhere like Linear or somewhere, somewhere similar, Farlow, something like that. Um, and you see the, you know, inverted commas, you see the noddy turn up, you know, and he's got a, a, a tent rather than a bivy, you know, that kind of thing, and he just pub chucks a bait out, and he yeah, catches, catches, he catches a big one. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And it's painful, isn't it? You're like, oh no, he's yeah, just it's happened to me. Pounder. Um, but why do you think that is? I tend to uh, believe that it's because he's doing something that's completely different to what the rest of us doing, out of um because he doesn't know no better. Yeah, uh, he's doing something so fucking outrageous. That yeah, it's yeah. You think surely, and he's got a blunt hook on, and he and yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Boilie that he's bought in 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 1990, you know. Yeah, you know, full of preservatives and yeah, um, and he catches a bigger. Yeah, and it's back to that conditioning thing, right? Hundred percent, hundred percent, and there'll always be, always be variables, and you know. Should everyone go out and just fish like a freaking noddy? Yeah, probably not. You know, it might work. It might not do, but it, it's more chance and luck than than anything else, isn't it? But yeah, I think generally if you, if you can go different to what everyone else is doing as much as possible, as long as it's, as long as what you're doing still gels with how the fish feed um, and it's what they want to eat on and yeah, as long as it still ticks the boxes that need to be ticked, I think you can do well on it for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure a little bit of my success this year has been because I was just making up these free solid bags. Um, like I said, I was putting plenty of sort of um, little bits and pieces in there that otherwise you'd struggle to deliver with a spod or a bait boat, anything like that. You know, you struggle to get them to the bottom because of the nature of the ingredients. Um, and I was just, if I if if the bag hit the bottom, I was happy, and that sounds stupid. But the the weed was so bad 
that if you count cast the five outs led into the weed bed, it wouldn't even get to the bottom. Yeah. So as long as I got any type of drop, I was happy I was fishing. And I'm sure that's why I had so so many fast bites because everyone was fishing on the clear spots. And I was fishing uh, amongst the weed. And it was going down in the in the fronds of weed and, and still being presented, you know, because it's just a solid bag, isn't it? Mm. Um and I had a lot of a lot of fast bites like that. Um I think one day in spring I had I had um seventeen bites in twenty four hours. Um and I say people's watching me with binoculars and they're taking their bait boats out and they can buy a bite. And I think it was because people are so scared of weed. Mm. Um, that they're fishing in a, in a bright, you know, big, bright, gleaming, clear spot. Um, and I remember years ago fishing this kind of this weedy, silty pit, and some of the fish you'd land them, and they was the mouths, and the, the, there was black right up to the back of the gill right. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. It was deep in the silt. It must have been. Um, and I think that's where the natural larder is. Yeah. Um, and that's a, again another little tell, which the which is very um, oh you reap the rewards definitely. Them them fish are, are silt things, aren't they? Yeah, if you've got a lake that's you know got silt and cleaner bottom, look at their mouths. Like it, yeah. a telltale sign is that their mouths will get stained, won't they? And mm -hmm. you, you've undoubtedly experienced this. Yeah. You can tell what they're feeding over generally. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing, which is quite sort of prolific on the place I'm on, is um, it's got a lot of naturals, which is, I think, is why the fish have been so big for so long. In there. Um, it just had a habit of, like, of producing massive, massive young fish. And um, I think the insect larva and the caddis and stuff is a, 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 a big part of that. And I remember it's very wind-dominated, so I'd, you'd always try and get, like, a warm wind in your face, you know. But because it's up high... Uh, the, the wind is quite savage, you know what I mean? You're above the tree line. So if you get, a, a, if it's 20 mile an hour wind, you know, everywhere else, it's 30 mile an hour up there. Um, and there's a lot of like um, in, in the edges or around the rod tips, scum. And when you looked, it was all like caddis larvae, mm. skeletons, shells, you know, like little ectoskeletons. Um, yeah, or they'd, or they'd crawl up in your bivy and dry out and fly off. Yeah. You know, a massive amount of naturals in there. Um, and then when I ever, whenever I see that, I'd, I'd kind of, I'd use a zig or, or try and mimic it as close as I could. Definitely, because that's where the food is. Yeah, yeah. But I, I kind of feel like them little telltale things are, don't kind of get picked up on how they should, at least. I agree with you. I, I, yeah, I don't do zigs. I struggle with it because I feel like I'm kind of cheating in a weird way, and I know it's ridiculous. I agree. I'm, I'm a terrible zig angler. I think I've tried them this year, um, I think 13 or 14 times. and It just seems unsporting in a way. I've never had a bite on, on a zig this year. I haven't had a bite this year on a zig. Uh, mm. And then I'm kind of glad I haven't because when, you, when you're, you know, there's a fish that, that the size I'm fishing for, I would never want to catch one on a size ten on a on a zig. You know? Yeah, if I lost one, I'd be suicidal. But I mean, if you turned up to a lake, there's a hatch going off, and you flicked a zig out in there, and you caught your target. I'm sure you'd be chuffed. Would that mean as much as to let's say the polar opposite, and it's the middle of fucking winter? There's ice on part of the lake. You're fishing, you're like you've, you know, you've applied yourself religiously down. Do you know what I mean? It's very different, isn't it? Um, um, yes. The reward is different. Yes. Yeah. Um, like I say, some guys are very, very good sea anglers, right? Um, yeah. I'm not. I'm just not. And, and yeah, and respect to them, it's a talent on its own, isn't it? It's, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just would hate to lose a big fish. Um, on on a light tackle, do you know what I mean? I would, yeah, um, yeah. And I know guys that I mean, I think the year before last, I think the first like um, 18 bites came on zigs. Wow, um, so they do have their place, definitely. Um, oh, so you've caught a fair few on zigs, then, 
Yeah, yeah, over, yeah, but um, yeah, but I'm not what you call a zig angler. I don't, I don't rate myself as a as a zig angler. You know, um, uh, the wee's been really bad this year. Um, I'll just, oh, it's funny, isn't it? No matter how well you do. Um, you can catch twenty fish in a day, but the only top, the only one you think about is the one you lost, right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> and and yeah, that's that's. I would just, I would just hate to lose a big one on that on the zig, like I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I just would hate to do it. And um, given the 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 place I'm fishing, the fish are it's deep water, um, and the fish fight phenomenally hard, just yeah, ridiculously hard. Mm. Um, and I can, I just can't imagine landing one on the zig. You know, it's a nightmare netting them, isn't it? You know, if you've got like a long fit, yeah. you know, unless you've got an extra long net pole. Mm. Um, not easy. No, not easy at all. It's right if you've got your power with you or something, and you can wade out and do the netting. But yeah, I've yeah. seen a couple of big fish this year lost on zigs to a couple of my friends. And um, oh, yeah, devastated. Devastating. I mean, what about yourself? Have you you, you 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 done much? Have you had any sort of special catches on zigs or not? No, not really. I've I've uh, in the past, like years gone by, years and years, long before this podcast, um, I've caught them um, popped up off the lead. Yeah, um, off the- but I mean, whether you'd call that a zig or not, I don't know. Like the word zig wasn't around back then. No, no, same. Um, it off the lead, didn't we? Yeah, just off the lead. Uh, you know, in in some weird, yeah, weird, like even in the margins, I've caught and popped off the lead, like weird, weird scenarios that you wouldn't necessarily do. But what sort of length are you talking off the lead? Just like mini, mini, couple of foot off the lead, or eight, eight to ten inches, so not massive. Yeah, that's another thing. How often do you see like a mini zig being cast out now? Uh, you, 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 wow, I, I don't fish those kind of waters, but I'd imagine you don't. You don't no. Yeah. I mean, have you ever, have you ever done any? You know, you fish the likes of linear and places like that, Farlows, all that kind of. I've thing. never, I've been to the tackle shop in linear, but I've never fished there, and it just, it just doesn't appeal to me at all. No, no, I've only fished it a few times. It was normally for, um, like a yearly social with a friend of mine. Right. Yeah, uh, it's up north. We kind of meet halfway, um, and the last time we went, we it's about it's about two and a half hours from me, and about four hours from him he lives up in St Helens like Liverpool way um and uh we got there we walked around for three hours and there wasn't a peg available you know <laughs> savage. yeah it just it doesn't do yeah, it for me. savage mate. we stopped and had McDonald's and had a chat for a couple of hours and then he left and that was it you know it was just a waste of everyone's time yeah yeah, yeah. It, it like it serves a purpose and obviously it caters for a lot of anglers and you know you know, crack on, you do you, but it's, yeah, it's not somewhere that interests me in the slightest. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of how I feel, yeah. Tackle shop isn't bad. I mean, where I live, there's not many good tackle shops, so that tackle shop's about 45, 50 minutes from my house, which isn't that far, really, considering I live in the fucking countryside. So yeah. it's, it's it's not terrible, but yeah, yeah, it's not for me. Hmm. Yeah, um, tell me a little bit about because I'm I'm actually um, when we've done this I'm actually gonna I'll, I'll speak to you we'll, I'll get you some uh, get some of your hook baits you can send me some of your all your bits. Yeah. Um, have you got anything exciting in the pipeline? Um, of I mean, it, obviously I'm biased, but I feel like everything I release is exciting. <laughs> yeah. If that makes sense, because it, it excites me. Otherwise, I wouldn't release it. Mm-hmm. but yeah I've, I've got so at the moment as it stands i mean by the time this comes out i'll have two base mixes out on the market um but as we record it there's only one publicly available yeah. um which is the hydro milk and i've got the the voodoo i've called it the voodoo because there's some you know stuff happening in there uh, it's very very soluble mix it's a fish oil bait mix uh base mix that's out it's been used for well over a year getting on for two years by my my testers i've got a a great a great few testers that like i really appreciate um so i've got that coming out 
by the time this goes live, that will be coming out. That is, in my opinion, you know, if you want a fish meal, it's just like it's not going to get much better. Again, obviously, I'm biased, you know. Uh, make your own minds up about bait. Do your own thing. Find what works for you and, and use it. But, yeah, I'm very excited about that. In terms of other things, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm always testing. Like I am, I spend too much time every single month, every single week testing bait. I'm absolutely obsessed by it. Um, and I own different businesses that aren't to do with fishing. Um, and like, it's a big drain on it. And if I was all about the money, I wouldn't be doing bait. But, you know, I do it because I'm passionate about it and I fucking love it. And yeah, there's, there's a few things that, that are in the in the works. I don't want to mention them yet. The problem is when I mention something and it's not released, I get so many people. Like I get a lot of people message me regularly, and I like oh it. My. It's great, and I get a relationship with them in of some sorts. But a lot of people kind of I don't know how to say this without sound like a dick. They they feel like maybe they are owed something because they message regularly and they. Yeah, once everything before it's released and yeah. it's like well i just i, I want to make sure it's right before i release it um so what's your um opinion on certain baits um catching certain fish like a, a milk protein for a common or a fish meal for a meal do you, do you believe in any of that or i do not 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 the combination that you mentioned, but I, I, I know you just gave a, uh, you just gave an example. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. But yeah, yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I hundred percent do. I think there's things you can do that will definitely appeal more to the, to a certain demographic of fish. If you wanted to go about catching 30 pounders that were only, you know, I don't know what's possible nowadays, seven years old. I think you could probably pitch a bait that would suit those. Um, in the same respect, I think you could pitch a bait towards 30 pounders that were 40 years old. I think the age of the fish has got a, more of a bearing on what they like rather than the size, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was listening to what John Baker was saying about older fish have got uh, amplified amounts of taste buds as they get older. Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah, interesting theory, and I, I think anecdotally – that would ring true mm -hmm. scientifically like as in hard data that is there in black and white and and people have done studies that actually mean something because a lot of studies are done and you can pick holes in it you know till yeah. the cows come home yeah it's a little bit shaky on that but uh, i agree with him um you know i'm i'm definitely not i mean who am i to to disagree with john baker <laughs> you know i'm not i'm not trying to shit talk him but i think the whole thing is a little bit flawed if i'm totally honest i think it's more to do with the age of fish rather than the size right okay yeah um it's funny because it was i got i sort of had those theories but never in practice and i was getting my bait off of uh, dean tally obviously you've had on here haven't you two or three yeah times. yeah a very knowledgeable guy um and i was actually using um one of his fish meals um, on that very weedy lake. I said with a lot of the boat work, and I caught I caught them all, um, but the one I couldn't catch was that big common. Um, and I was picking his brains, and he said to me, "Change your bait, go onto a milk protein, and you'll catch it." And I went, "Well, I, I can't see it, mate. You know, I can't. You know." Anyway, long story short, I changed the changed the bait, um, went on to his uh, milk protein bait. His um, HXB with the, HXB, yeah. The cinnamon essential oil on it. Um, second trip called a big common. Same rig. I argue that. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't. Can argue with it. Yeah. And so there's that definitely highlighted it for me. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. The, there's definite things you can do, and I mean, I mean, D Dean rolls great bait. Um, obviously, I've spoken about uh, Kenny Gates's bait as well. Yeah, I was actually looking at Kenny's baits earlier. You, you, you rate it, do you? Yeah, Kenny rolls a, a phenomenal bait. He does. And the reason why I was going to bring that up is um, his, uh, I can't remember what he calls it, his red spice. It's oh, a spicy red yeah. um, bait. Receptor red spice, that's what he that's calls it. it. Yeah. Like, he, 
like that that catches a lot of comments and i understand why it catches them and i've spoke to him a lot about it and and it his beliefs co- you know coincide with my beliefs as well um it's a great bait dean towie you just mentioned he rolls a great freaking bait um the bait you mentioned hex hxb is a, a milk protein bait with you know fairly high levels of milk proteins in um with with some spices in uh, and it's a fucking good bait yeah the these different these bait there's certain baits that i really honestly i am sold on it they will catch certain types of carp yeah that, uh, and there's well, that other was... baits that, that will catch other types of carp i'm really believe i'm a big believer on it for sure well okay so i'm after this 50 pound female <laughs> mirror um it's about 25 years old um I call everything but her. Um, there's a lot of nut bait that goes in my water. There's yeah. a lot of um, sticky baits, Manila, that goes in. Um, like I said, I've never analysed it. I don't know particularly what's in it. I, I, I would presume it's a nut bait. Lots of nut mills in there. I yeah. Um, uh, yeah. At least seventy percent of the people are on sticky Manila all year round. Well, well, what what that fish that you want? What does it come out on? Comes it's been out of Manila. Um, my my one of my best mates is the head bailiff. Um, he's had it like four or five times on Manila every time. Okay, how long has he been fishing there? He's a head bailiff. He's been on there seventeen years. <laughs> so, so so that so when has he caught it? Over what years? What frequency? Um, well, I've, I I photographed it three times this year um, to three different people. Um, they was all using sticky base manila. That was uh, early spring and the end of the summer. So, do do you feel that it likes the sticky base manila, or do you feel that like that's the fucking that's what most people are using? So they're yeah, more well, of averages. I kind of, I, I, nutritionally, I don't I don't rate it nutritionally, um, uh, but I think it's. If if eighty percent of the lake are using it, um, they it might see it as a, a, a more of a natural food source because so much of it goes in. It's all relative, right? Yeah, um, I mean, so that, yeah, that's my belief. On it. I think it. I don't. I don't rate it nutritionally. I don't think it's a particularly good bait. But if everyone's using it, it's going to get caught on it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you got anything that you think I could, you know? So it, it's twenty five years old. It's yeah. female. Female. Um, it's how big? Fifty-five pound. Fifty-five pound at the moment. The last time it came out, fifty-five pound. So it's probably between fifty-six and fifty-seven pound now. Well, uh, was it? Was it stocked at a high weight or? No, no, no. It was. It was the first fish in there. It's been in there since day dot. Um, been in right. there say, twenty more than twenty years. Um, plus the age it would have gone in there at. Does uh, the does the water get fed by the owner? Does he no, like, not at all. It in or anything? No, not at all. Not at all. No. I mean, I know that firsthand unequivocally because my one of my best friends is the head bailiff. Um, he he he's there twenty four seven. He's been on there eighteen years. Um, the owner, um, you don't see him down there at all. Um, the lake maintenance is done by myself the head bailiff, the other bailiff, there's, there's two bailiffs and a handful of us that do all the work on the lake. We take yeah. it out, we, you know, do the swims, all sorts of stuff. I mean, I put a load of barley straw extract in this year. I put about a hundred litres in. Yeah. So we all muck in and there's a handful of, a handful of us that muck in and, and do the graft. Yes. Yeah, so and I know unequivocally I don't get fed. It's only anglers baits, but the majority of people are using either sticky baits or mainline cell. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah, it's it's a in it's a fairly young fish. Twenty five years is. Yeah, it's not super young, but I mean it, it's all relative. It depends what fraction you you know you're coming at from, right? Well, it's not it's not an old fish by any standards, but no. it's no cross. So I, them fast growing strains don't tend to make old bones. If I was if I went on that lake. I would I'd use my what I call the voodoo mix, which again I'm trying to sell shit, but I would go for uh, you know high levels of fish meal. Um, it's it's 
again, I don't want to like. But I did. I, I, did I don't, don't want to be. Go on. I did have that opinion because uh, uh, there's not a. First of all, I don't think there's very many true fish mills out on the market. I, I could totally agree with it. Yeah, I could, but I don't think there is a, not no. real. Um, I mean, how much presented? percentage of uh, uh, you know the so-called fish meals nowadays that they got in them not much what, not what, much what do you reckon 20 percent uh yeah fucking scary thing is like since this podcast is is blown up within the last maybe couple of months different companies have approached me for for like consultation and i've got to understand a little bit more about what is in a commercial bait and it's fucking scary <laughs> like it's yeah. scary you know that there's there's not that much fish meal going in these baits and do you know what that's that's not to say that old companies are just cutting prices and things like that no, no you, you if you have too much fish meal you have too much protein obviously that's going to be a digestive issue yeah. and obviously a lot of companies are working around that issue totally respect that but these fish that are fish full regularly yeah, they're probably not seeing a bait that is ram full of fish meals, high protein, high nucleotides, high. It, it, they're probably not seeing that. No, I mean, I uh, so the, the the general consensus is people take a bait boat out, right, and they put a scoop of pellet in their boat, um, a scoop of broken up boilies, Manila or or sell. Um, yeah, maybe a couple of scoops of pellet, you know, like two or three meal pellet, um, manila pellet or, or krill pellet, something like that. A uh, scoop or two of chops. Um, and then a hook bait. Uh, that's the general consensus. That's what I used to see. And, you know, um, time that falls through 14, 15 foot of water. I mean, I imagine you've got a spread of about the size of a, a small bivy, I'd imagine. Um, there's a few people that are absolutely filling it in. Um, but this, again, it's all like patches of baits with, with, with a bait boat, you know? Very yeah. same, samey. Um, like I say, um, there's three or, three or four of us on there who have absolutely dominated this year, myself, um, a young lad, a friend of mine, um, a very, very good angler. He's had over 70 fish. Um, and he's doing the same as me. He's doing little solid bags. Um, very, very good angler, very clued up, very, um, does you know, gets up at first light, washes the water, moves on them, very sort of proactive angler. But I would doubt there's anyone putting a real good old school fish meal in there. Just, I just haven't seen it. Yeah, so I think there's mileage in that then. If I was you, that's where I put my energy. I, I don't, I mean, it's not necessarily like put a shitload of fish meals in there. No. More is not necessarily better. Um, I think you need a lot of soluble, a lot, a lot of CPSP90 is going to hold you in good stead. Um, yeah, I, I would, I mean, you know, again, way more than I do. But I would, for me, the most attractive bait is a fish meal. And I think over the years, most of the big fish I've caught have been over old school fish meal baits that I've made myself. I agree with you. I think the caveat to that is when they're overused, you go in with a high protein milk bait. Yeah. I think you can absolutely wipe the fucking floor of everyone. I really believe that. I really do believe that. It was like a fad thing, wasn't it? Do you remember in like the 90s and 2000s, it was a lot of old school Robin Red type fish meals. Oh, it? yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was fashionable. And now you don't see oh, yeah. it. It's, now it's the other way isn't it again it goes back to being different but yeah it's for you i would go in for high levels of fish meal um you mentioned glm way earlier in the podcast i i have got a massive faith in glm the problem is nowadays you can't get good quality glm you want the full fat stuff not the defatted um yeah it can be a fucking problem getting that stuff but it's a good one I don't, I don't know if you if you're in the defatted or full fat camp. Like companies' integrities, you know. Huh? I'm always que questioning a bait company's integrity most of the time. You know. Yeah. Uh, is is there really the the stuff in it they say that's in it? I mean, we'll never know, will we? You will never know exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who who's policing it? Who? How yeah. can you police it? Yeah. 
I, I totally agree. Come. Which is why it's nice if you can build a relationship with someone like a almost like a one man band. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the likes of Kenny Gates or yourself or or, yeah. or Dean Towie or, or someone you can have a you know a, a chat on the phone with and because most of these massive companies haven't got time for you, are they? They they, yeah. they, they want someone to advertise their bait on Instagram and catch a few fish and push their brand, but they don't, you know, you're just a number really, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Really. And um yeah, so so an old school fish meal, you think that's definitely the way to go. And and what would you fish? I mean, like, like I say, I fish a lot of special hook baits. So would you go in with something like your um your is it wizard? Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like <laughs> it sounds like it's turning into an advert, doesn't it? No, no. But yeah, it, it, yeah. If I was after if I was after an older mirror, um, yeah, I'd be using my fish meal mix, and the wizard has got something in. <clears throat> I mean, you asked me earlier if there was something that I would not roll a bait without. Mm-hmm. there's something in the wizard um and this is in the blurb on the website so you can read is about it, it. Yeah, it's uh, just the tmao isn't it like no no not at all no it's not that tmao is is not a secret it, it's used it's used more widely than people would think um um but no there's something else in there that is it just it just fucking works it works like cotler work it's it's crazy um you can overdo it for sure. I actually, and I'm not proud to say this, I actually killed one of my fish by overfeeding this particular thing. Wow. Um, and when I say overfeeding, it was crazy amounts. Uh, I was experimenting, not proud of it. As I say, terrible fucking thing. I am the worst person as far as empathy goes for animals. Like I just don't want to hurt them. Mm. Um, but yeah, very sadly I overdid it on that. But Used on the right levels, um, it's actually very healthy. Sorry, I was, I was listening earlier about you know you had Dave Moore on, you know, and um, yeah. he was talking about preservatives, you know, and how those killing fish. You know, oh, it's not a preservative. No, no, no. I know that's not, but I'm, I mean, getting you know talking about um, he was he was mentioning wasn't he about a preservative that they've done studies and it killed fish, right? Yeah. Um, and I am, that's one thing I will never use, and I'm completely adamant about it. Um, I will never use a shelf life bait ever. I just, I just hate them. Yeah. 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 And, and it also locks up a lot of the goodness. And you got to think when things break down, like it, if a boilie is breaking down in the water, um, a lot of those different compounds are cleaved. So they're broken down, their molecule molecule size is broken down and they're more attractive so if it's preserved you're stopping that process yes yeah and isn't it like the the uptake of the nutrient uptake is affected as well right yeah yeah 100 percent. yeah 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 i mean uh <laughs> i i'm quite into my nutrition because I've, I've trained for sort of 17 18 years um i've body built for about 15 years and i power lifted and you know, as a result of it, I've got a you know a damaged back. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I deadlifted seven hundred pound and I squatted seven. Um, I bench pressed sort of two hundred kilo plus, and yeah, as you do when you're younger, and you know, now my back's suffering for it. So I was all always into my nutrition, and yeah, uh, yeah, macronutrients, and 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 uh, I would never want to eat a food that you can you can put on the shelf for a year late, you know, and I've always, I've always thought that about baits, you know, like shelf life boilies. And, um, you get like a quiet little fishing shop and they put a lot of Nash bait on there and a lot of CC Moore or whatever these big companies, you know, um, and those, those bag of baits might be on there for a year or two before they get bought. So what on earth have they got in them to, to keep them good for a exactly. year? Exactly. I know I wouldn't want to eat, I wouldn't want to buy a steak or a bag of crisps that are good. I can put on my shelf for five years. I mean, what on earth have they must have in it? You know, it just it just blows my mind. You know, like a loaf of bread. Back in the day, you'd make a loaf of bread, right? And it lasts two days, wouldn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Now you can buy a, a, a loaf of King's Mill or something, and it will last a week, ten days. And you think, what on earth is in it? At least that's how my brain works, anyway. I agree with you, mate. I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's um, 
It's the world we live in. It is the world we live in. Dale, mate, we've been uh, we've been going for a while. Is there anything else you feel that we should be covering before we um, out for the night? No, I think that's. Uh, I think it's it's, uh, it's been nice, mate. It's been a uh, been a pleasure. We've had a sort of a, a frank chat, and we all about all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, what about from yourself? You got any questions for me? No, I, I think. I mean, I'm. I'm freaking I'm many drinks into this right now and I'm feeling <laughs> I feel like I'm slurring words, but I don't think so, mate. I mean, you've covered things in detail again, just to just to let everyone know that like this guy, we've not really spoken about it that much, but this guy has caught an obscene amount of very big carp um, over the last year or so. And, and obviously before that as well, but um, yeah, he, he's definitely caught. He's caught more big fish than I have. That is for damn sure. Um, so I think, you know, probably worth listening to what he's saying. I don't know, Dale. Do, I mean, do you think if you were to like, if you were to be able to put up a billboard, like a big message to everyone that carp, that fishes for carp, what would that billboard say? What 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 sort of knowledge or ethos uh, do you want to impart to everyone? So, like I said earlier, I'm very kind of unsocial on, on the bank. In regard, or I don't just mean that um, with other people. Well, what I mean is um, when I turn up to a lake, I want to have a look around um, and, and look for the tail signs. That's, that's an obvious thing. Like most, most anglers do that. But I try to fish away from the crowd Um in regards to people and, and line pressure, I think that's a massive thing in, in angling. Um, the two, on, on my water and on most waters, the two most dominant things, in my opinion, is the wind and the angling pressure. So the two things that, that, that make the most effect on the carp, where the carp end up being located, in my opinion, is the wind. If there's no one there, the wind moves them, right? And if people there, the angling pressure moves them. So if I turn up on the lake, I don't go where where the most comfortable swim is. I don't go where, you know, with Davies and Johnnies and, you know, because the sun's in their face. And I go as far away from the rest of the crowd as I can. Um, uh, because I think on these pressured, uh, heavily stocked um day tickets or syndicates or club lakes, you know, sort of commercial fisheries. I think the angling pressure is the, the biggest thing which dictates the location of where the fish end up. Yeah. Without yeah. fail, I will go as far away from anyone else as possible. Now, another thing I'll do, I've got, I've got a, a guy that I fish with, I'd say he's a very, very close friend of mine. Um, he's the bailiff on the current lake I'm fishing. Um, we fish together quite a lot. However, uh, he might he might plot up next to me more often than not. I would always go into his swim and take my receiver with me, than rather than him come into my swim. Always, without doubt, I, 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 if anyone approaches my swim, I see them coming. I hear them coming. I walk up and I, I stop them before they get into my swim, um, because I think that's a, a, a massive thing as well. Um, I'll always go and sit in there, swim, and have a cup of tea or a beer or whatever. Um, yeah, th those things I, I do indefinitely on every water I fish. Uh, I think there's more anglers now due to the COVID situation. Um, the lakes have never been as busy. Uh, yeah, so they're things I do without thinking. I will, I will always, always go as far away from other people as I can, irrespective of the size of the lake. And I know there's that thinking of people say, well, you know, you want to be on the fish, and I do. But first of all, I don't really like encroaching on other people. Um, and secondly, I think that those bigger solitary fish, they're real big ones. I don't think they're. they're I don't think they feed in the pack. I, I really don't. I don't think they, they're a shoal fish. I think they stay away. Um, and I know people like you know if you if you look at the writings of people like Mark Holmes and stuff, um, Jim Shelley, they will say the same. Um, fishing away from the majority of the pack of fish. And I don't know what your take on that, but I think there's, 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 there's some... 
that's for me that's yeah. the way to yeah as long as it's not for the sake of it i mean the, the fish has to be there don't they yes yeah i mean obviously i go on i go on uh what you see and what you hear initially um but let me give you an example. So my lake got a lid on it about a month ago. It completely froze solid for about four or five days. But up until then, most people was going down the deeper end of the lake, right? You think winter, fish are going to be in the deeper water, it's warmer, okay? On the surface, that's what it looks like. However, once the lake freezes, I think that's a completely wrong place to be i think once the lake freezes um and 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 the majority of the pressure was still down the deeper end of the lake now when it is really cold where does where does cold go it goes to the deepest part oh. drops down yeah ends up being in the deepest part of the lake however these people are still fishing down the deepest end now when it's had a complete lid on it all that cold water, cold goes down, cold air drops. It has to be, it has to end up in the deepest part of the lake, right? So, I mean, don't neglect the shallows in the in, in the colder weather. Um, and yeah, for me, I just I, I like to be away from the crowds. That's partly from how I am. I like to I like to you know do my own thing. Um, and like, like I say, the two things for me in my own fishing that definitely affect the fish the most is. When there's no one there, if you've got the, if you've got a place to yourself, the, the, the key things for me are the wind dictates the location of the fish, generally, and then after that, it's, it's angling pressure. So that's if I had a billboard up, that's exactly what I would I would put on. Stay away from the crowds, um, be a bit stealthy, um, and just yeah, just be away from the angling pressure. And if you have the place to yourself, follow the wind, follow the weather. I mean, what's your? Is that you got? You got similar thoughts on that? No, I mean, I, I think the thing is, like, we can have these, like, yeah, I, I agree with you. By the way, I totally agree with you. And uh, the thing is, it's easy to get in like that fucking dogmatic frame of like, okay, well, X is happening, so Y must be happening in the lake. And I agree with you, and, and you're absolutely right for fucking saying what you've said. But you need to let the fish tell you what is what. Yeah, you can only go off what you see. In this. Like, like exactly. Yeah, it's like what you see and what you hear. Yeah, you you can you can spend countless hours on the bank, and in my, you know, years gone by, I've done that, and I feel like I have known those carp from that lake. I feel like I know inside out, and then there'll be some fucking freak weather front come in, and just something. Something different will happen, you know, weather wise, and it will completely change their, yeah. their behavior. And I'm like, fuck. Like, I obviously don't, I haven't got them sussed. No. Um, it, there's always a variable in there, isn't yeah. there? That's the great thing about fishing, isn't it? It's, yeah, 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 yeah. On your toes, you know, and you see things that for the life of you, you can't think why they're there in that shallow water, in that cold weather, but they are. Um, and I think that's part of the mystery, isn't it? And I think that's part of what yeah. keeps back every every session. And I think we learn more from the blanks than we do when we catch. And for me, that's what keeps me going back every week, that sort of stubbornness of I will bloody catch you and I will, <laughs> you know, you won't beat me. And, yeah, for me, that for me, Sam, that's what keeps me going back day in, day out, week in, week out. And, you know, even in this horrible weather we've had recently, I just sort of refuse to be beaten. And, uh, yeah. That's what I love about it. Good man. Good man. Dale, it has been a fucking pleasure. And uh, yeah, you have, I don't, I feel like probably in the introduction, <laughs> which I haven't recorded yet, I probably announced how many fish you catch. But just to reiterate, this guy is catching a lot of big fish. Uh, he really is. He's going out there. He's in the weeds. He's doing it. And maybe we haven't spoken about your captures enough. I don't know, but uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure having you on. And uh, yeah, perhaps we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure, mate. And um, yeah, I'd like to come on again sometime. Give me a shout. And uh, in the meantime, I will message you and um, we'll sort out some of your uh, your special hook baits. And bits. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'll send you some out. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah.
Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Sam. Cheers, bud. Bye. Psst. If you're still here and you happen to be listening on the Apple Podcast app or Apple iTunes, please take a few moments, leave me a review, let me know how we're doing with this podcast. A, it's really nice to hear from you, and B, it helps this podcast stay relevant and stay in the ratings. If it doesn't stay in the ratings, it falls behind, um, people don't listen to it, and obviously that means there's not much point me doing it anymore. So if you can take a moment to leave me a review, I'd really appreciate it. If you're not listening on an Apple device, I don't think you can leave us a review, unless there's some means that I'm not aware of. Um, But Nonetheless, I appreciate you listening. It does mean a lot to me. And uh, yeah, feel free to, to reach out on social media. That's it. I look forward to bringing the next episode to you very soon.